Hello. I just want to um, say that I don't have a presentation. I wasn't aware of that. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. I'd like to welcome you to the um, sixth of the, of the uh, presentations, the series of presentations of uh, in the series of um, uh, towards the theory of AI. Um, this one is, is the sixth, and I say, and it, therefore it's kind of halfway through the whole series. And therefore, um, I want to take an opportunity during the session to go and um, uh, do a, a, a summary of, of what we've addressed so far. Um, let me also say we had a few problems with last week's session, which was the most incredible session on AI and neuroscience, um, in that it was blocked by YouTube for copyright reasons. We have since uh, uploaded it again, uh, and I hope that um, uh, you'll be able to access it. Um, I'll just go back and just mention one thing on this on the the main the main the main um, uh, poster. There is a link which takes you to our YouTube channel, where we have a series of all the lectures so far. On the on the left hand side, you can see this reference here, FIU DDES lectures. Um, if you click on that, you will get the series of different lectures. Um, and some of them are the lectures of, of, of Theories of the Digital, which is what we're in now. Some of them are AI tutorials um, given by Daniel Bolojan, which are extremely useful. And some of them from another series we're doing called My um, uh, <clears throat> Beach Urban Studies, <clears throat> Miami Do You Love Me? And this was a session about Zaha and Miami. So these are being left uh, as a repository. Anyone can, can access them and simply um, find that site and navigate your way around. We've also put it on um, Billy Billy. Um, this is uh, um, not so easy to find, but on the right hand side, we have the link to the Billy Billy site. Um, so <clears throat> if you can do a screen capture, perhaps you can find that. But we also have exactly the same um, sessions that are uploaded on that as well. So please uh, feel free to, to check those out. Um, I also mentioned that there are another uh, set of series of lectures which are part of the Digital Futures um, Worlds uh, series. And I want, uh, um, particularly want to draw your attention to the one on AI and creativity that we had uh, last week, um, which was really about the creative use of AI um, um, by architects and uh, artists today. And we started off with the work of Refik Anadol, but we also saw some of the extraordinary work coming out of SIARC, um, um, Daniel Jovanovic, uh, and Lydia, his partner, and uh, the work of Casey Ream. This is the... Um, uh, the new Campo Macho project that they did, um, which is astonishing in itself, um, and also the Dream Estate project, which is not so much AI per se, but AI powered um, um, or, or AI, uh, uh, creative um, uh, productions that involve AI. So there's a whole repository of work which is available online and um, which um, you're free to, to, to use. Um, so just to say something about this series for those who've not joined before, um, this is growing out of the Digital Futures uh, work in the summer, um, where we were in, we were trying to kind of rethink the notion of education, um, uh, and and we noticed that we were able to kind of break through the walls, the physical walls of the um, uh, of the classroom, and extend our reach to. Um, architects and students all over the world. Now, this is, a, we think is a wonderful thing. We want to continue this. Um, we, we, we're leading a project we're calling the Global Classroom, where we can, we can make all our work accessible to everyone, everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, Philip Jan and I are exploring the possibility of a, a doctoral program where we will um, share that, that platform with a number of other institutions. Um, so this is, in a sense, is, a, is an attempt to um, a kind of prototype, testing out the water to see how we can um, uh, bring everyone together on a single platform for, for, for such a work. So today we're, we're looking at the question about um, AI uh, and architectural design, which actually we've been looking at the whole time um, in different ways. We've been looking at it, but this is the site type. This is the session that is that has that title. Um, and I just want to say uh, 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 two things. One thing about that, but basically before I uh, and, and do a survey of what we've done before, and then launch it as such. So, um, in fact, this is part of two sessions um, looking at architecture design. Uh, next uh, next week, we'll be looking more seriously at uh, AI in the office of the future, where we'll be looking about uh, looking at how um, 
uh, uh, software tools have been developed that are going to transform architectural practice as we know it. Um, this week, though, we're going to look at the more kind of let's say speculative side of things, the uh, especially the academic side of things, um, and, and 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 look at the the more kind of free form experimentation before looking at the more tightly controlled and precise work that needs to feed into the office. So I'm just showing you here some, one of the examples of the kind of uh, work that comes out from um, schools of architecture. This is a, the result of a workshop with Daniel Bolojan looking at style guns and and, and um, Cycle GANs, uh, the work of one of my students um, at FIU, Florida International University, um, Mario, um, and and this is one thing you can do, and it, it's 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 kind of amazing what it can do, and so on. It can open up new territories, and so on. But it's not very precise. It's also it's also working in two dimensions. Um, other studies uh, are beginning to sort of look more precisely at architecture. This is the work of um, uh, Nico, also one of my students. Um, who is, has been exploring, looking at a data set of um, uh, the work of Tom Main, Morphosis, and exploring um, how you can begin to sort of iterate other possibilities. Um, Tom Main himself has um, been working on combinatorial studies in his work and has been using Grasshopper to iterate and do variations on a particular kind of theme. Well, this is an attempt to take, uh, take things further. Um, We'll be having a discussion with with Tom Main on Tuesday and, and look at how we can explore further. But it's looking at the possibility of of using GANs to hallucinate further um, design forms, um, and and hopefully we will we will we will um, uh, taking this to much greater detail and much greater resolution. I should also say alongside this, there is a, there's some work that has been produced by um, Cor Pimmelblau um, by Wolf Pricks. In fact, it's uh, Daniel Bolojan who's we're here with us today who will be um, uh, uh, who is le leading that particular initiative. So there are two sides of, of, um, uh, of AI and architectural design. One is the much more experimental academic side, um, where maybe it doesn't matter too, too much how precise you are in the work you're doing. And then there's the office, which is getting increasingly um, precise and tight, and which needs to be able to kind of realize these uh, ideas in concrete form and work with them in three dimensions. So next week, we'll deal with that. Today, we'll look at the whole question about um, um, about how you, you can work experimentally with some of this work. So this is the sixth session. Um, this is just to give you an overview of what where we've been so far. Um, all of the uh, previous five sessions are uploaded um, onto on, onto our, <coughs> our, our website. Um, and I wanted to just kind of recapitulate or draw together the threads of what we've been talking about, because it's all feeding into the question about architectural design, even though the session today is the one that it's got, has the title, Architectural Design. Um, so let me just recap and, and pick out um, some, what I, I think are maybe the kind of the, the, the key takeaways of some of the sessions that we, we had in the past. Um, the first one, which starts off with the kind of the um, um, ambitious title, What is AI? Um, but in fact, it is actually quite important to be able to kind of to really have a sense of what we're talking about AI, because what we find, there are many differentiated forms of AI, and there's no one single entity AI, rather there are different sort of um, uh, ways of, of, um, of looking at it. Um, and the, the, the kind of starting point of our discussion was really this comment, um, what is it exactly that, 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 that AI does? Um, and uh, this is a comment by Margaret Bowden, the kind of grand old lady of, of AI research and a very distinguished person in her own right, um, a wonderful person. And she makes this statement, which I think is possibly how many people in the past have understood AI, that it's basically trying to do what we do, what, you know, trying to do what human minds can do. Um, it's trying to kind of mimic, replicate, or even equal the human, the human mind. Um, I, uh, during the session, I questioned that and said, well, is that still the case? Um, partly because in some areas, computers are significantly better than human beings, especially in games of Go and chess and so on and that area. And, and, and which means that, uh, that they're no longer trying to do things, some things that the minds can do. But also I'd say that there are things that, that AI can do better than minds. And therefore, we can't make that simplistic description anymore. Um, uh, we're in a different sort of situation. Um, but I thought in, in that session, we went through a series of, of differentiations. I mean, the real challenge about AI is the term itself, um, which is an umbrella term that includes other terms. Um, so what we're dealing with largely today, and I think most of our presentations will be about deep learning. This is the latest form of, of, um, uh, of connectionist work. Um, and 
that itself is in within a category called machine learning, um, and that is in within a broader category called called architectural intelligence. So in a sense, they're like they're nested inside each other like Russian dolls. And although we might refer to to all of it as AI, there's a significant significant difference between what was done in the very early days back in the 1950s and what's what has been done done now. One way to sort of see that difference would be saying between what a car might have been in the early days of, of, of car manufacturing of, say, let's say, a Model T Ford and a Tesla. There is absolutely a huge difference between them, um, and we shouldn't uh, we should be aware of that. Um, uh, uh, so we use the same term, but what we're talking about now is significantly different. It's dependent upon things like cloud computing, much better algorithms, much better computer power, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but we still use the same term. And I think throughout AI, there are a series of differentiations, not simply between these, these different sort of categories, but also between the, the different tribes, the different ways of approaching AI, of which symbolism, symbolism and connectionism have been the most um, important. And connectionism is now reasserting itself, or has reasserted itself as by far the most important. We can also look at the different ways of training AI, uh, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning, and, and supervised learning, and so on, and so on, and so on. I'm not going to go into that now, but simply to say that there is in order to understand AI, we have to go through these different categories and understand precisely um, what we're dealing with, because um, uh, there are many, many things, aspects in it. The umbrella term is, in some sense, is not very helpful. But the key distinction we have to make is between human beings and AI, and the important point being, of course, that, human, that AI does not have consciousness. And we introduced this, this discussion about the Chinese room experiment, which is a, perhaps the most clear and famous example that is critiquing the problem, the, the, the limitations of AI. AI doesn't have consciousness. In other words, it's not aware of what it's doing. It's not sentient. And this is the example used by the philosopher John Searle from Berkeley, where he talks about how someone inside a room is following instructions and translating Chinese, even though he has no understanding of Chinese. Meanwhile, on the outside, <clears throat> um, a couple of people are clearly convinced that what's happening is this guy knows what Chinese is. Uh, and we can say the same about chess or Go. AI can play, DeepMind can play, can play um, uh, uh, AlphaGo can play Go, but it has no more understanding of what the game of Go is than your pocket calculator has. It has no capacity to think. And that's the important question. Whether or not consciousness is so important or not is another kind of issue. I personally don't think it is so important, especially as now what we're talking about anyway is not AI versus humans so much as AI as an extension. Of humans, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so we're talking about extended intelligence rather than simply um, AI versus humans, and therefore, if, you, if human is involved in the loop, we are talking about consciousness being there anyway. The next session was was looking at the history and the future of AI, which itself is another story. I mean, the future of AI is particularly interesting in many ways, but it's important to tell the story of how we got there. Um, and the work of Alan Turing, the secret work during the, during the Second World War on computation, he was the first one to um, posit the possibility of intelligence um, in this article in 1950. And, and subsequent to that, the term artificial intelligence has been uh, coined. Um, we speculated in, our, in, our, in the session whether may, maybe we should be talking about it as synthetic intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. Artificial is a somewhat uh, demeaning term, and maybe we need to kind of rethink what we mean precisely by that, because maybe artificial intelligence, as we know it, goes beyond the limits of human intelligence. Therefore, human intelligence is only a, a broader aspect um, of, 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 of intelligence itself. And we came to the conclusion that really the quest for AI was the quest for intelligence um, itself. Um, but the figure of the, 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 the example of the self-driving car is, I think, a really interesting one to think about for architects um, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, most obviously, once you have a car where you don't, where you don't need a driver, um, drivers become redundant, and once you have an AI where you don't need an architect, architects become redundant. But more importantly, um, still, I think the idea that um, the way these things um, um, emerge is not in some one particular moment, <coughs> like a sort of singularity, <coughs> sorry, um, or, or some such thing, but rather through a gradual process of incremental improvements, updates. And in the case of the Tesla car, it was software updates. And the, the Tesla car is now, or can be, self-driving, um, but you almost didn't notice the moment. Um, and equally, from that point of view, all these predictions about the future in terms of the singularity, really, we have to question whether or not um, 
uh, we're going to notice this kind of moment. It's going to creep up on us um, and, 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 in, and at different speeds. Not everything is going to become um, <clears throat> I'm operational at once. It's a more complex story than many people like to think about. So <clears throat> the question of AI creativity is important for, for two different reasons. One, as we mentioned before, the Digital Future session was about what forms of new creativity does AI afford? Um, and uh, But also the question is whether AI can be creative. And I guess that traditionally there have been a number of kind of comments um, looking back on it, saying essentially that AI can't do what humans do. Um, it's not capable of doing that at all. Um, this comment by Moko Dakotose Watanabe, who I have to say is actually open to the fact that, that AI might be able to um, uh, be better than humans. And, uh, and this was, was made, this comment made back in 2016, I think, um, published in 2017. Um, machines are better than people at solving complex problems with many trying conditions. In that realm, people are no match for machines, but people are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Well, that that comment itself we know is 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 is, is no longer correct. Um, it might have been correct at the time, but this is an example um, of the use of style GANs. Um, uh, one of the versions of um, <clears throat> what's called generative adversarial networks GANs. Um, that gradually have been improving over time. Um, this is style GANs, and you can see how human faces can be hallucinated um, with um, remarkable realism. Um, and these, of course, are faces of those people who um, do not yet exist. Um, and equally, um, um, there, this is the work of X Cool, whom we'll be hearing from next week. Um, it's possible to hallucinate buildings um, that do not yet exist. Um, if you this is clearly fed on, on data of modernist buildings and it's generating um, a, a kind of a whole kind of range of possibilities um, of, of extrapolating or uh, um, extrapolating possibilities beyond the data set itself in some ways. Um, and if we if we want to find the, the maybe the, the kind of primary example of the kind of creativity and let's say it's a kind of a strategic creativity um, rather than necessarily the more general form of creativity we could look at this moment in this match between Elisa Doll and AlphaGo when AlphaGo comes up with a move, move 37 in game two, that they thought was a mistake, but afterwards realized was one of the most brilliant moves ever made in, in Go. It hadn't been made before. And the possibility exists um, um, of, of AI in certain spheres being vastly superior and showing up the limitations of human intelligence. And then um, the last session, um, just briefly, um, really was an extraordinary session in the sense that um, uh, we brought together some of the most significant minds in the field. Um, we brought together uh, Refik Anadal, whose work I'm showing you here, alongside Anil Seth. Anil Seth is um, one of the most inspirational um, <clears throat> um, neuroscientists in the world today. He um, is a professor of, of consciousness in the University of Sussex alongside Andy Clark, and uh, he has really been opening up the question about how we hallucinate. Um, and, and then we brought in Memo Acton. But the, the point was there was a series of, of, of artists and architects and, and, uh, and neuroscientists all thinking about the same kind of question about the issue of hallucination. And I'm showing you here a study that um, Patrick might begin to sort of recognize in some way. It's a study of the work of Zahadid architects, um, which um, is is uh, is based on uploading thousands upon thousands of images of uh, the works of Zahadid architects um, into the computer, and that, and then letting the computer sort of to uh, uh, to operate within a latent space and to generate the possibility of these um, particular um, um, kind of uh, ex extrapolations from from that particular um, data set. Um, and what is interesting about this particular work is that at a certain moment. Um, and you have to be able to kind of maybe grab that particular moment and freeze it. Some of this work really does very, come very close um, to, to the work of, of Zaha. So let me just kind of let it run for a while um, and, um, uh, and talk about that. So in a sense, uh, what if you're working um, with, as I, I mentioned, uh, uh, extended intelligence, what you're talking about maybe is the human being able to kind of intervene and to make that selection. Humans are very quick at, 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 at sensing, let's say, what, whether a, a cocktail tastes nice or music sounds good or a, a painting looks beautiful and so on and so on. And they, that's the idea that basically the, the computer is generating this kind of range of different options and then 
the human steps in and begins to kind of um, uh, to, to make that selection. So just in a moment, you will see something. I don't know if Patrick's seen this before, but something you will see look, looks right now quintessentially Zaha. Um, so uh, we put that question of what to machine, what to Refik calls machine hallucinations alongside Anil Seth's um, notion of how perception itself is a form of controlled hallucination, a really fascinating um, uh, take on the question of, of, of perception itself, how we effectively are um, predictive and how we, 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 we're kind of making our best guess, uh, our brains are making the best guess about what's out there. Um, and this, of course, is the famous behind the famous TED talk that he gave, which has more than 10 million hits. It's certainly a very interesting kind of thesis. Um, but the person maybe who um, <clears throat> comes closest to Anil Seth's work is Memo Akton. Memo is a, um, a fabulously talented um, uh, Turkish uh, um, artist, um, AI expert, um, trained as an engineer. He came to London, started practicing um, in interactive and started developing an interactive design um, consortium and then um, moved into doing um, some work with AI. And this is his work that he's, that he's been doing, which is um, feeding into his, his PhD thesis at um, Goldsmiths. Um, and what you're seeing basically is, is a, a neural network that's been trained on certain data that is interpreting ordinary things on a table on the left hand side and seeing it through the lens of that trained neural network and interpreting in a certain sort of way. So here it's 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 clearly um, well now into, into into flowers. It's it depending on, on which how it's been trained, it will look at the, the the keys and so on and interpret them in terms of either flowers or ocean or clouds um, um, and, and so on. And that itself is remarkable. Um, it's more an exercise in perception than maybe an artwork, but truly fascinating. And then finally, this is also for Patrick. This was a, a project that one of my um, students did, kind of following the same kind of logic in some ways. Um, so on the left-hand side, this is Fernando Salcedo from Florida International University, FIU. On the left-hand side, this is wardrobe, his T-shirt. On the right-hand side, in fact, there are a series of, of studies he did, but this we start off with a, um, a network trained on a Zaha buildings from a research center in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And what effectively it's doing is interpreting those forms on the left through the lens of the neural network and what it's been trained and producing hallucinating a kind of an architecturalized version of that. He also did one that's based on the um, uh, trained on um, kind of generic um, uh, tower blocks in, in downtown Miami and which in fact is kind of interesting because they are um, very regular and therefore you can kind of see the distortions very clearly and here it is reinterpreting his tie and generating a kind of um, a, a sort of a, a, a building as though it's kind of, let's say, architecturalizing the vision. Now, what that says about the architectural imagination is deeply fascinating. Um, anyway, these were some of the things that we were talking about in the past and in and of themselves. I think that each of those sessions are extraordinarily rich. And now we're embarking on the kind of the, 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 the topic that was behind all of them in any case, the idea about how we deploy these technologies in architectural design. Um, and I, what I would sort of say is that we, we, there are so many different ways of, um, of, of, of using them. And today we'll, we will have um, a series of presentations, uh, starting with Daniel Bolajan, then going to Matthias Del Campo, and then going to Emmanuel Coe, um, looking, offering some options as to how architects have began to use these tools. Um, one of the, the, the key issues, I think, in some ways we could even talk about some of the, the use of uh, Grasshopper has been a kind of early form of of AI, it's not machine learning in any way, but it is automating the sort of process. And some of the work that's been generated algorithmically over over the over the, the years could be understood as a form of AI. And this is a project, for example, that I worked with uh, Christina Shea and Spiele Vedechnik um, for an installation in, in Netherlands, which was was generated using um, um, software called iForm, which is a form of um, uh, uh, stochastic non-monotonic simulated annealing in other words it's a form of kind of like annealing of gradually kind of uh, 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 um, allowing some form to harden to, to um, like steel it becomes hardened through through the process of annealing and it's also a non-monotonic stochastic one which is calling into question what's happening before therefore you don't get um, any single um, uh, outcome you offer a range of outcomes um, and in fact i'm very much against the notion of the, of 
of, of, of the concept of, of the optimum. We don't know what the optimum is. All we can say maybe is there is a, what we call optimization, which could be could determined a quest for the potential optimum. Anyway, what the, the, the unnerving thing about this, certainly for Spieler, was the fact that actually the computer was generating this, this, um, this out, these outcomes, um, and the architect was no longer in control. Uh, Mamel Delander has offered a, an interesting take on that: the shift, um, in other words, between the old-fashioned notion of the top-down architect imposing form on the world um, in a kind of demiurgic gesture, the top-down architect versus the architect who is the controller of processes. You unleash these processes and they come up with these outcomes. Well, <clears throat> that raises, of course, apart from the fact that it kind of really changes how we understand um, design, and I think it's going to be coming in increasingly relevant as a kind of approach, um, but it also challenges what we know, what the term design itself. Are we going to call it design or are we going to call it outcomes? Are we going to call it designing or are we going to call it searching? This is an early comment that I made about um, about what, what you could do computationally with algorithmic design. And in many ways, I think it still holds true. Um, it becomes, in a sense, um, the, 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 the whole process becomes uh, shifts into being a kind of create a, a question of kind of creating a search space, unleashing an, an al algorithm, and then evaluating the outcomes of that search. Um, but that really calls into question the terminology. Are we talking about designing or are we talking about searching? Are we talking about outcomes or are we talking about um, designs as such? Um, and are we challenging in some way the old fashioned notion of the genius of the architect and so on and so on and so on? And I think this kind of this comment encapsulates in many ways the kind of way that we seem to be going. So I just want to mention um, a bit more in more detail a, a concept that we've already addressed in, in some ways, and something that I find incredibly useful. I've noticed that it's a concept that's permeated the discourse of Akim Menges in particular, and that is the question of affordance. If we have these tools, and if these tools become an extension as a kind of cyborg-like extension of human beings, making human beings, as uh, Elon Musk puts it, superhuman, uh, how are we to understand the role of these particular tools. Um, uh, what is their impact on, on the whole the whole process? And I, I increasingly find the term affordance to be incredibly useful. It's a term that essentially means what can you do with a particular tool? Now it might be, for example, you can use a screwdriver on the left to bang in a nail, but it's not terribly effective. A hammer is more effective. It affords the possibility of banging in a nail um, uh, much, much more. Um, but you might be able to screw in a, a screw using a um, maybe a knife or something or any any sharp uh, um, blade or something, but it's not terribly effective. A screwdriver is better at that particular post, it, at that particular task. It affords the possibility of that. And that concept of affordance, um, and of course it's based on the limitations of what you can do. If you're too, you're a, a tiny child, you can't reach a doorknob, a door handle, then you can't use it properly. Or if it's too stiff and you're too weak, you can't use it. But nonetheless, the notion of affordance is a really beautiful concept, what we can do with tools. And today I want to sort of start up by, um, uh, so some, to say there's some comments here that uh, defining what we mean by um, affordance, it was a term that originally Coined, but coined by J.J. Um, uh, Gibson, um, but then used by others. Don Norman famously um, talks about this. Um, uh, affordances provide strong clues to the operation of things. Plates are for pushing, knobs are for turning, slots are for inserting things, balls are for throwing and bouncing. The concept can be taken further, and I think it's a very rich and dynamic one, and, and opens up the possibility of how we can... Um, we can take these tools and use them in a creative way, often perhaps in a way that the tool has never been intended for. Um, uh, I don't want to get a scribe agency to, agency to tools, but it's as though a tool would invite the possibility of being used for, for something. Um, to to use Louis Kahn's expression, which clearly doesn't make complete sense, um, uh, what does a brick want to be? Um, well, these things don't have agency, we use them, but we use them with a range of, of possibilities that are a kind of 
that are afforded by those tools itself. So today, um, uh, we won't have Patrick, we're presenting. Patrick is here, but he won't be presenting, but we'll have uh, Ms. T.S. Del Campo, Daniel Bollard, and Emmanuel Coe presenting, each with these different takes on what they are doing, largely with um, uh, uh, with GANs, with genital adversarial networks, and just showing the kind of the, the possibilities, the experimental possibilities um, of what these tools afford. So I'd like to start with Daniel Bolojan, then we'll move on to Matthias Del Campo and um, finally Emmanuel Ko. Um, and I, I think you, you're you're being treated today to some of the think, leading figures in the field um, and what they're doing. So it's it's wonderful to have them here to um, uh, to present their work. So let me stop sharing. Um, and Daniel, um, let me hand it over to you. I should say that Daniel is. Um, uh, part I mentioned before, he is part of the kind of Corp Himmelblauer initiative um, um, with Wolf Pricks for Deep Himmelblauer, um, which we'll see more of next week. He's also um, um, a colleague. Uh, 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 he's also working at, at Florida at uh, Atlantic University. He was at FIU, uh, a colleague of mine, and um, uh, uh, he is one of the most dynamic figures in the field. He also uploaded a series of um, tutorials onto our website, which uh, of how you use AI for for pix to pix style GANs and um, uh, and cycle GANs. So um, let me um, stop uh, sharing. Neil? Yep. Can I butt in and give a few comments? Y yes, yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since I, I learned the presentation later, so thanks a lot, it's a very interesting overview. I just want to have a few, uh, a few thoughts uh, from what you've been saying. So you're contrasting design with search and the way we're looking at now at, at, at computational design. I mean, actually, um, design was always, to some extent, that. Uh, it, it's not the fiction of this kind of clair, clairvoyant uh, um, creation, but, but when we work as designers and we confront ourselves with a kind of semi-random doodling, uh, we, we, we also kind of confront ourselves and, and, and see things, hallucinate things, select things. It's also an evolutionary process, very much so. And for me, anyway, uh, I would say that evolutionary theory is the, up, is the overarching master theory, which also, for instance, has been applied to consciousness. And now this idea of you know, a perception as hallucination, which is firing out, generating, and then kind of selecting through what matches, it's the mutual matching, which actually then it theory of consciousness already it, it generalized projection, which, we, which he had. And also when you talk about consciousness, we need to realize that, that the consciousness itself is less kind of platonic conscious than we think, and it's, it's only a small part of our intelligence. So I wanted to say that. So, and um, going from there, for instance, whole idea of affordance is also very strongly uh, a part of an evolutionary trajectory because evolution in nature and also in, 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 in technology, et cetera, is always working with these found capacities, another word I use, which then become uh, somehow accidentally utilized, um, a refunctionalization, detournement, um, is, is, and then they, they become functions, and in biology is saying when they select the effects, when they when they stabilize, and the raison their raison that is an accidental side effect or for some, selected for something else, but now is kind of selected for that. Then you have this kind of honing in of the initially accidental affordance into something higher, more, more specifically adaptive. So I think that's very important. And as a general point, I would think evolutionary, I mean, if you think various paradigms of AI, I mean, you have to be careful that the AI slogan isn't kind of uh, exclusively taken up on architecture by this particular way of working with guns, neural, particular kind of neural network focusing. And actually neural network training is an evolutionary process, but with a particular focus on, let's say, uh, similarity matching somehow. Um, and, and Whereas, of course, the more general genetic and evolutionary computing is matching against set criteria which are more diverse. And I think one thing which, which reminds me of this current phase is that we, it reminds me of the, uh, of, the, of the 80s, actually, where we had a lot of these kind of raw generative processes just to, to expand the repertoire. And, and, but then we were very conscious of the fact, of course, that we need at some point some kind of analytic evaluation and, and sifting and selection criteria, which are not necessarily similarity uh, uh, um, or interesting visual recognizability. Although I'm not excluding that as an important factor and even accidentally a lot of performance um, criteria might 
come along accidentally with, with similarity. But I think we need then a separate process of, of verifying that. And we also, we don't get a lot of performance criteria, for instance, the particular uh, constraint on, the, on, on these oculi in our, our research pro uh, Saudi project uh, is, is probably lost because of certain that there's a certain directionality which is consistent with so, so I want to remind ourselves that this is only a partial um, um, it's, it's, a, it's an important part of a design process uh, uh, in terms of raw expansion of imagination and, and this, uh, it cannot be uh, standing in for complete design process in a, in a, in a, you know in, in academia it's partial investigations are always uh, valid, but of course, if you're talking about uh, real work projects, you can you can't deliver on the basis of partial partial process. But anyway, very stimulating stuff, and um, I'm looking forward to, to further communication. I hope that was was a helpful interjection. Absolutely. No, this is this is all about interjection. It's about a forum for ideas, and I would I couldn't agree with more with you more. Um, um, just to say that beyond this, next week we're going to talk about the more serious work of. Um, uh, of of the office, and maybe we could invite you to talk about the Zaha office in that context for for next week. Yes, um, it'd be great to, to hear that. Uh, and but then beyond that, we're going to have a session on performative AI, which is to say yeah. the performance, the structural design, yeah. the environmental yeah. design. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have um, in our team um, uh, Theodore uh, Galanos, who who has been writing many of the software for um, much of the software, um, infrared uh, and, and so on, butterflies. So. Um, Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. And I also completely agree when you say that we, we've already be, always always been doing that. I think that's a comment that, that Manuel de Lander has also made, that actually that process of kind of evolution, genetic uh, evolution, is what we do anyway. We do a few sketches, we pick out the best one, we're going to do it, work on that further and so on. That's been precisely the point that he's been making. Um, and uh, no, I could absolutely totally agree with it. And also, um, you know, if you work in when we there's a certain type of sketches, and we are particular when cultivating this when when we talked about abstract machines and so on, where you where you throw out lines and you don't know yet what they whether they're walls, uh, uh, roof edges, demarcations, or just implied lines, and then you then you kind of go in and test out some capacities of these graphic structures, we talk about graphic spaces. So we're in that space again. I mean, this is incredibly familiar to me uh, in terms of uh, kind of a conceptual methodology, except that we have no more, more, the generators are much more, let's say sophisticated now and much more proliferous now. So it's very worthwhile to go through that again. Yeah, I mean, just to say also that the, the I mean, the, the, the particular affordance I, I always like to refer to is, is you know the, the the use of the computer to to gener to, to be able to model cur curve curved lines because you know in the days of parallel motion drawing machines you could do that with a french curve but you had no clue what you were drawing and therefore there was no control over it therefore dot 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 now that we can model curves i mean effectively you're the person who's been kind of championing this um we're into this domain where we can kind of operate in that way it's it's a result of the affordances of the, of the tools themselves the other, other comment, Patrick, that I would say is, is that what you are, seem to be alluding to is the way that actually that these processes mirror human processes. Um, and that's been something that's also been a constant theme that's coming out, the idea that AI becomes a mirror in which we can understand human intelligence and human and creativity. That is, that's always been what I personally been interested in, but it's been coming out again and again and again. And one of the most fascinating aspects of last week's session, where we had Anil Seth, um, working with some AI artists is the fact that actually neuroscientists and AI um, <clears throat> AI specialists are almost in the same camp. Um, in fact, uh, Anil Seth himself did a PhD in um, AI before working on neuroscience, and there are plenty of other examples. Um, uh, Jeffrey Hinton and um, uh, I don't remember his name, the guy who's in charge of DeepMind in London. Um, uh, they 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 did the opposite. They worked on neuroscience and they moved into AI. So that, to my mind, is almost the most fascinating thing about what's happening with AI, is how neuroscientists are understanding how the mind works, and architects are beginning to architectural theorists in particular are beginning to understand how architects think and how how we design. If design is the right word for that, but uh, no, th thanks, Patrick. That was, that was fantastic. So let's um, move on to 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 Daniel Daniel Bolojan. Um, uh, so if you'd like to share your screen. 
are you able to see the screen? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you, Neil, for the invitation. Um, so um, I know that you were mentioning that maybe it will be a, a good uh, idea to present the uh, Sagrada Familia project. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to also uh, give a short introduction, uh, at least to touch on some topics that, in a way, let's say that they uh, they um, they are important to understand uh, why the Sagrada project and uh, how I started to work on this. Uh, so initially, for me, all this. Um, application of AI in architecture, uh, it was something like a sort of academic, uh, let's say, um, curiosity at the beginning. I think uh, at the end of 2016, when I started to, to engage with machine learning uh, at Innsbruck University, at the uh, Institute of Structure and Design. And then slowly uh, that idea started to creep in into uh, Kupiombla, where I was uh, also working as a computational design specialist. Uh, and there, yeah, I started to develop um, AI tools for uh, for the practice, like for um, creating processes that augment designer uh, abilities, uh, processes that optimize certain uh, certain tasks or um, or different levels of design. Yeah. So right now, I think most of most of you, you are familiar with DPM Blau from a design perspective, and not from the optimization and those kind of aspects which is a bit, you'll say, more boring side of it. But the PMO blog is a very interesting project that tries to address multiple levels uh, in the design process. So um, just a bit of background for, uh, about myself. Um, I was very, very uh, uh, impacted by this quote uh, when I was in uh, Diane Gevante at Studio Hadid. Uh, I think this was one of the quotes that uh, actually changed a lot the way that I started to think about architecture. Initially, I thought that it was Peter Truman who said this, but then later I, I figured out that it was actually Liz Werner. And this kind of understanding of architecture as a um, system with multi-layer components. So I started in a way mostly to think about uh, architecture from that kind of perspective. Uh, so I'm going to try to touch on a few aspects of how I'm, uh, how I'm working with AI, and I'm going to touch on a few topics about design specs explorers, structural encoding, uh, qualifying criteria, how you can use uh, AI there, and mostly then I'm going to focus on the semantic representation learning, which is the Sagrada Familia project. So my main interest here is I'm really exploring the potential of uh, teaching machines to interpret, to perceive, to be creative, uh, or to propose new designs. Yeah. So I'm not interested in automating. I'm mostly interested in uh, augmentation. I'm interested, for example, in Copian Blau, where I'm very interested in developing processes and strategies that augment uh, the previous processes. Yeah? So how can we design even better? Uh, and then also when it comes to, to uh, other aspects of design, it's not necessarily about replacing the designer with an AI. It's mostly about creating a sort of a system that helps a designer in the exploration phase of a project. So of course, traditionally, we, we had this kind of idea like of you know, an empty canvas that uh, we, uh, most of the creative process they, they had as a starting point. But I think like it was also expressed by Patrick and also Neil, mostly design is something more complex and we understand it as uh, something more complex. So if you know the expression hunting a needle in a haystack, I think design space is something like uh, hunting a needle in a flock of birds, yeah? Because why I'm saying this is because it's almost like you take a decision and suddenly the entire condition changes and certain, uh, certain opportunities open up and other opportunities they close down, yeah? And then you take another design decision and again, you go through this kind of process of expanding and contracting in a way uh, design space. So this was already like 2017. I was very interested in this idea of, I was back then I was very fascinated about uh, self-organized systems like uh, agent-based systems. Um, so I was very fascinated about the idea, how can I explore the design space of those kind of systems? So I started to deploy this kind of like uh, neural networks uh, um, and other ML uh, strategies to try to understand and to explore and to visualize in a way design spaces. 
And then of course, with that, I started to also look into these kind of aspects of how can I analyze perhaps the design space? Can I, can I have very analytical approach here? And I can, can I figure out a way to evaluate these kind of results? Because the problem here is, uh, I think it's fascinating for us to, to have like hundreds uh, of uh, thousands of uh, iterations and of options. But the problem with that is that in the end, it's very hard for you to choose, yeah? So if you have 10 options that are quite dramatically different, and let's say they, they are defined by 10 parameters, it's very hard for you to make a judgment and say which one is better than the other one. So imagine then if you have uh, design spaces that are uh, in the order of tens, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, yeah? So then I started to, to think about this kind of idea of so how I can evaluate those kind of things. Another kind of aspect that I was very interested in was also how can I encode design intentions and how I can have, in a way, this kind of AIs understand those kind of design intentions, yeah? So here, this is in line, in a way, with this kind of idea of I'm not trying to automate, I'm trying to augment something. So for, for the machine, in a way, for, or an AI or network to, to really um, uh, assist in the design process, it has to understand somehow the preferences or intentions that I have for a certain design. So then it's just a matter of how exactly can I encode those kind of designs. So for me at this phase, for example, agent-based system was just a sort of placeholder or framework that allowed me to, to encode that kind of idea. When other geometrical systems, I think they are a bit more challenging or more limited. And here is the same kind of idea of design spaces. So can, I, can you have a design space that you can literally just explore by moving uh, your mouse around the uh, screen, yeah? And then uh, see the, the entire design space. But like I mentioned, be, mentioned before, it, the problem here is that once you start to have uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, options, suddenly it becomes extremely difficult for you to actually uh, uh, select or choose uh, filter in a way those kind of options. So then of course, I also, I was very interested in, in aspects of structure and coding and maybe this one, it's also sort of, um, it, it came before the interest in, uh, in design spaces, I would say. So this is almost like for me, it's always a, a sort of progression. Mostly I have some, uh, some uh, uh, interest, like how to encode certain intention and then uh, I'm trying to solve those issues and suddenly I start to engage with certain technologies. And for example, with AI, more or less, I ended up with AI because of um, agent-based systems and certain limitations that you have with agent-based systems when it comes to the number of agents that you can afford and also like what kind of information you can bring in like structural information and so on or environmental information. So once you start to bring that kind of information in, everything becomes extremely slow and uh, you barely can do something, yeah? So then I started to look at this kind of aspects. Can I use in a way this kind of predictions uh, like AI to predict certain uh, structural layout and then have that layout in a way influence somehow the agents. So in this instance, I was mostly using uh, 2D information. It was a uh, pix to pix, uh, very, very early versions. And then of course, uh, I, I really wanted to look at aspects of 3D because structure, it's actually a 3D condition, not just a 2D. So I started to look uh, at our other kind of networks, in this case, uh, variational, variational autoencoders to try to, to have sort of predictions for this kind of agent-based systems. So in that, in that instance, for example, you have an agent-based system and you'll have a prediction that runs real time. So the agents are moving, the prediction is updating real time and you have then uh, structurally encoded, let's say agents, yeah. So for me, it always was a sort of, the way that I ended up in AI was mostly because of this kind of ideas. I, I was trying to solve certain issues and then I started to go into um, statistical learning and then slowly you go into uh, ML algorithms, neural networks and so on. So here's the same thing, just uh, the agent system running and then you have a sort of like finite element analysis a prediction that uh, runs behind real time and influences, let's say the way that the agents are, um, are going to behave and interact. 
So like I was mentioning before, one challenge that you have when you are working with this kind of vast design spaces is how exactly you judge the results, which are the criteria, which are the qualifying criteria. And here we, you can say you have qualifying criteria, which are very uh, quantitative and others that are qualitative. So the ones that are quantitative, let's say they are kind of easy to, to um, or easier to, to evaluate, but the ones that are qualitative, how exactly you do that, how you evaluate design from that kind of perspective. So here, what I started to uh, to work with, I started to look, uh, to look into machine vision and somehow is there a way to have an assistant that looks through all these like hundreds of thousands of uh, of options and already give us uh, gives a sort of score for those options, yeah, and then maybe that will help me in a way filter and uh, and search easier this kind of vast design space that I was uh, working with. So in this instance, uh, I was mostly working uh, with five, I think, criteria, and uh, this was a project done uh, in Innsbruck uh, with the students from there. And the idea is really like I'm working with an agent-based system. Let's say I'm running the agent-based system, and then I have on top of that, I have a, a sort of um, a machine vision algorithm that looks at the results and tries to score them and give in a way this kind of scoring based on a few criteria that you are defining. So then, as you can see, you have the machine in a way looking, understanding clusters and aspects like that, that then uh, can inform your decision when you are picking a certain design. So all this kind of process for me was always a matter of, and I think this this should be, or we should be careful with, with uh, how we apply AI in architecture because um, we cannot just apply one AI over the entire, let's like, say, building and have just facades of buildings and then expect that that AI learn exactly how uh, how arch that architecture works in a way. Because in the end, what it learned, it just learned the visual representation, but it learned actually the underlying you know, structure and systems that, that define that kind of uh, facade or that kind of building. So here I already started to, to engage in this kind of process of you have to really understand design process and maybe break it into a discrete task. And then for each discrete task, we can think of what type of network I might need or which kind of network can be useful for this kind of uh, task. Yeah? So like that, we start really to, uh, to chain in a way uh, networks and to have multiple groups. Uh, we, we had 30 students in this studio. We had 30 students, uh, there were 10 projects and we ended up training about 60 networks and we were able to generate about 50,000 uh, designs or outcomes. So here you have then an entire process of, okay, you, have, you wanna have a machine learning how to design a project. So which are the skills that are relevant perhaps to encode that kind of information to the machine? So is it important to, to encode design intentions at local level? Is it important to uh, describe design intentions at global level and so on. And then also qualifying criteria. And only after that, maybe you can say that I have a machine that is now able to generate because it's not only able to generate randomly without knowing what it's uh, generating, but it's also able to look back to qualify the results and then to generate, yeah? So here we were already looking in this kind of aspects. And then what we started to do is we started to, to look at how can, can we, uh, let's say transfer from one group, transfer some qualities to a different group, yeah? So here, these are some, some uh, results from different groups looking at the results from other groups and extracting in a way or translating some information from there into their project. So this is one, one of those projects. Um, so the next part, which is mostly uh, the, the project, um, um, Sagrada Familia project, is um, we have to understand that our perceptions um, and our conscious visual, let's say, representation of the reality is not a direct mapping of the, of the world. Yeah. So we, what we are doing, we mostly interpret our uh, our uh, reality through reconstructions and interpretations based on our personal, let's say, uh, past experience. So if we think about it in that way, we can say that. Uh, our own past experience works as a sort of filter. 
in the way that we are going to perceive things and in the way that we are going to evaluate or interpret things. If we are thinking about, uh, about architectural design, it's a very common practice for us to, um, to actually um, learn the semantic representation from one domain, be that like consciously or not, we are learning uh, rep visual representation or semantic representation from one domain. And then somehow we transfer that into our architectural domain. Yeah? I think Neil, uh, you were sh uh, showing also past uh, meetings, um, this example of Opera Sydney by Joel Hudson and this kind of translation from about sales to architecture somehow. Yeah? And I think we are mostly doing that all the time yeah, as architects. We are really engaging in this kind of process of translating, interpreting something from a different domain outside of architecture and interpret it back into architecture. So this idea I was very fascinated about. And um, this is how I started to go into uh, this project, Sagrada Familia. So I was really looking at this aspect of, of um, how, how to, um, to teach a machine to look at outside domains of architecture and then extract just the relevant information from there and bring it into architecture and give an interpretation. So my very first um, tryout with that were, were uh, this again, which is a, a, a deep convolutional um, GANs, generative adversarial networks, and also style GAN, like early on, uh, the early on version of style GAN. And of course, the very first uh, options there were very, very poor, in special the DC GAN. So I was working with a data set of about 70,000 uh, images, and still they were quite poor. Now, of course, a lot of issues were also in the data set, the, the quality of the data, and so on. Um, but also probably the algorithm is not really the strongest. But this was the very first uh, iteration. And then I went into style again, and I remember I was waiting for this uh, one month on a uh, Titan RTX. And even after one month, you see the results are not really that, that uh, good quality. Um, but what you see here then, you see a sort of a machine that was able to, to look at the large data set, 17,000 images, and then was able to learn the representation. Yeah? Uh, but what I was bothered by was the fact that um, this learning process was very confined uh, uh, within the data set that was provided, yeah? So it's almost like previous uh, uh, meetings, if you remember, we were, I was talking about uh, Demi Sasabi's um, uh, four types, uh, three types of creativity, yeah? One, uh, uh, so you have one that it's interpolation, one extrapolation, and the other one uh, to innovation. So when we talk about style, uh, style GAN and also DC GAN, mostly what we are talking about, we are talking about a type of interpolation. So mostly we just have the data set defining our design space, and then the network is just interpolating between points in that data set, but it's never going to go outside and create something completely new outside of the data set. Yeah? So for me, that was something that you know, I was not really very happy with because like I, was say, I said at the beginning, I really wanted to, to have this kind of idea similar with the way architects look outside of their domain and then translate into architecture. I want to have a network that is able to, to do something like that. So of course, style GAN, uh, cycle GAN, it's one of the networks that it's able to do something like this. Um, but also here in this instance, um, I'm looking at a data set of uh, forests, like a lot of images from forest, and then a lot of images from Sagrada Familia. And then you have after, after training in, in a testing phase, you have the network in a way uh, that was able to learn somehow the representation of Sagrada and looks at in a way compositions that you find in, uh, in the forest and tries to interpret in a way those compositions as being Sagrada Familia in a way those compositions. So here, one challenge that I had also was that we as humans, we are not really learning in this kind of way. Uh, before I was telling you that I was using style GAN and this again with 75,000 uh, images. And we as humans, we don't work that way. Huh? For us, uh, as humans, I think we, are, we, ha we have different ways of filtering data. And many times we are able to learn 
uh, just from a few examples, we are able to learn something. Yeah? So uh, if we want to translate, let's say, ideas from, uh, from uh, sailboats, we don't need to look at 75,000 sailboats to, to be able to translate something in architecture. So in that sense, then I started to look at which will be the factor that will, uh, will influence the way that the network will learn, yeah? So here I was looking at resolutions and to understand in a way uh, which is the impact that the resolution has on, on the, uh, the amount of uh, information that the network learns. And these were some results after, after uh, some time of training. But these were still this kind of, um, you just look at images of forests and you create a sort of interpretation. So it's way superior than the previous style GAN in a way experiments where mostly you had interpolations. In this instance, you can already start to talk about a sort of extrapolation where you are actually going outside of your data set, yeah? Because you're just, mostly you're just understanding co the composition of a collection of uh, samples and then that composition you're translating to the other domain. So here, just just um, uh, a full, you know, a video of that, that entire interpretation. So as you can see, like the the higher you can go uh, with the resolution, the better, because you can learn a vast amount of uh, data like that. Of course, it has to do also with the architecture of the network, how how deep in a way it can uh, learn and so on. Uh, but those aspects uh, are too detailed right now. So here you are still dealing with a cycle GAN, quite conventional cycle GAN. Let's say, yeah. uh, I haven't started to yet make improvements, but after this, I'll, I'll start to show some some uh, results that uh, I already started to go into the network and start to look at certain aspects there. Okay, so this next example here, I already started to look at at ideas from from uh, style GAN. And then also I started to look at aspects of um, how do I how do I operate the filters of the network in a way to to create this kind of idea of there is a lot of information that is not relevant when looking at force for example there is a lot of noise there that is not relevant for the network to actually consider and to uh, to translate into this kind of sagrada in a way uh, interiors so then. What kind of filter, how do you have to design those filters of the network? The same way like we as humans, we have our own filters of interpreting things. The same way, which should be the filters of that network to be able to actually interpret things correctly and to discriminate in a, in a way uh, against this kind of information like, you know, uh, leaves and uh, noise that is not relevant to discriminate or to exclude that information and just leave in the structure, the compositional structure that it can be found in the, in the forest examples. So here I already started to, to go into that kind of uh, part. And as you can see also the results, they start to, to actually uh, move in a complete different direction where um, a lot of the detail that before was there, right now it starts to be excluded and you have this kind of like more, more defined like uh, surfaces almost. Yeah, so mostly I started to look at this kind of aspects of ideas that you find in Stalgan, and then also look at the convolution uh, filters of, of the network. And these are like a few, a few examples of uh, a few results from there. And in a way, just to understand the, the kind of um, quality in a way that results from, from those kind of changes. So here, another challenge that uh, uh, we have with this kind of ideas is that right now you are working with the data set that is defined, let's say, um, uh, images of Sagrada Familia. At this point, the, the data set is quite small because the filters, the network filters are uh, improved and also other ways of uh, other techniques from StyleGAN actually help um, have the network train train faster with less data, 
but still you have this kind of uh, problem. Okay, how is this useful then in design? You know, for me it was, if I don't have a forest, then I don't have an interpretation. So how can I create a forest or how can I create a composition uh, that the network would look, look like, a composition that let's say has some design intention behind and then the network can look at it and give an interpretation, yeah? Uh, so what I started to do is I started to look at these kind of ideas of um, having- and Do you allow us the question? Yes, go ahead. I was just curious because, um, well, first of all, it's a fantastic breakthrough, uh, which, which first alerted me to the whole uh, potentials. So congratulations, on this is stunning. But when you uh, start to use these two data sets, uh, we all know the Sagala Familiar data set, we don't know your forest data sets. So I just wonder how you work with it. You, it seems to me that the forest data set is only delivering what you might call the compositional structure and all the tectonic or uh, articulation, morphological articulation is coming from Sagala Familia. That's how did good. you ascertain that? So did you, did, is, is the forest uh, images kind of abstracted down um, or is it something where you can, when you bring them together, you can allocate these, uh, let's say, roles? So it's mostly uh, has to do with the filters of the network, yeah? So for example, if a network looks at a face, it's going to be able, based on the filter that it has, it's going to be able to uh, to define eyebrows and uh, the nose and the mouth and so on, yeah? So how exactly you describe those kind of features, yeah? So it has mostly to do with that. Like uh, you have a network that looks at the forest and it should be able to look only at the composition, yeah? Okay. So it's almost like you're, you're uh, controlling them, the filters, the same way that we as architects, we are in a way trained in a certain way. So we are going to interpret things in a certain way. Yeah. So the same, the same happens also here then. Um, I'm trying to remove that kind of noise that is not relevant, perhaps compositional wise, and just allow the composition to come through. And then from there, I carry that composition into this kind of uh, uh, model. Okay, clear enough. Thanks. Okay, so here, like I was saying, you know, the, the challenge that uh, um, I have with this is that um, that input data set or what the network is looking at is just a forest, yeah? So um, I cannot really encode much design uh, intention there. I can maybe go in and uh, distort this kind of images or something like that. And then I, I'm, I'm asking the network to look at the images and give a different interpretation, but that's not really a, a very uh, sophisticated, let's say, uh, way of operating. So here, what I started to do is I started to say, is it possible for me to have a style again, perhaps that that learns the representation of a forest, for example. So uh, either way, you know, style again, it's great at interpolation. So for me, it's enough to have a network that learns to create forest, yeah? And then the other problem was that, okay, now if you have the interpretation, if you have the interpolation generated by the style again, again, you end up with a, with a data set or a sort of model that is confined within that data set that was provided at the beginning. So the, the thought here was, is there a way then to, um, to maybe also have an impact manually, you as a, as a designer to have an impact on the composition of the forest that will have an impact then on the interpretation of the cycle again. So here, what I started to do is, is this kind of process of blending two networks. So what you're doing, it's almost like you're taking the lower levels uh, of uh, the lower uh, resolution levels of a network and you're blending them with, with the other network. So what I mean by that is a network like a Stalgian, uh, you'll have certain information that it's encoded at the lower level, like let's say 64 by 64 pixel, and you have complete different information that is encoded at 512, 512, yeah? So if you say, let's say 64, 64 or 32, 32, you're mostly talking about the main uh, structure composition of something. If you're talking about 512, probably you're talking about uh, details like, uh, you know, the, the texture of the leaf and the venation and everything like that, yeah? So in this way, then I train completely different data sets, yeah? So you have one, one uh, uh, style again that learns to create this kind of gradients. And those gradients could be in a way encoded by you as a designer, yeah? Uh, they can, uh, uh, you can encode design intention through those kind of gradients. And then you have that kind of gradient composition and you ask, in a way, a, a forest 
that have again, let's say, to copy that kind of structure. So like that, you have a way to go in manually almost. And you, as a designer, you can encode then intentions like that, yeah? So here then, there, these are some, some iterations then of, of that kind of process where you, as a designer, can describe certain gradients, certain ideas perhaps, and then have the network also give an interpretation. So in this instance, for example, for me, I'll consider this uh, more creative than just a style GAN. A style GAN is just an interpolation. A cycle GAN is already something more superior. And then if you start to encode and chain networks in this kind of way, then already you talk about something that truly you can say that actually it's creative, yeah? Because otherwise what we are talking about, we are just talking about a machine that learned something and it's able to spew in a way data within that, that data set, which is not, not that, that uh, creative. So of course, one big challenge here is the topic of 3D. So Sagrada Familia, it's fantastic from a 3D perspective too, but you cannot really then evaluate Sagrada Familia just from this kind of perspective of 2D information and semantic information that it's uh, described just in 2D. Although I'll make an argument that I think as architects, we should in a way look at all those kind of le levels. I think they're all relevant. We should not exclude one for the other. Um, but I think if you wanna try to approach 3D, uh, it's a bit more challenging. So here I started to dive into this kind of uh, aspect of 3D. And of course, um, the, uh, if, you, if you have networks that learn 2D information, then you have this kind of struggle of how you how you convert things in 3D, yeah, and most of the time you end up creating this kind of like almost uh, height maps in a way to try to give a sort of three dimensionality to the result, but it's not truly really then create it's not really a 3D in this instance. So what I started to do is I start I, I found a, a model of Sagrada Familia, uh, the same that I showed here. So this is a, a a model that I found, uh, um, a free model of Sagrada Familia. And I started to uh, use this model to extract then 3D information and look in a way if I can have perhaps a style again, learn to, uh, to operate with this kind of 3D data. So here, basically what you are doing, you cannot really input the entire mesh the entire building as it's very, very complex. So what you're doing, you're almost like creating this kind of crops, like 3D crops of the geometry, where you're trying to extract perhaps, you know, parts of the geometry that are very relevant for what you're trying to, uh, for the task that you're trying to, to solve. And in this case, I ended up with about uh, 3000 uh, 3D model crops. And then what you're doing, you have a style again, it's a sort of a matter of how you encode and how you have in a way the 3D geometry are represented correctly for a style again to be able to read. And then um, you have the kind of interpolations then that, that uh, happen. Now, these are very early stages, as you can see, like uh, the level of detail of 3D is not really that sophisticated right now. You might find some arches here and so on, but it's not really giving you that kind of uh, level of resolution that, um, that you have in 3D. So this is something that uh, I'm, I'm still working on, but just to show in a way, uh, sort of progress where, where this goes. Uh, right now, I think one, one big challenge is this aspect of, you know, um, I'm, I'm working with two graphic cards that are quite strong, but still um, uh, the amount of resolution that you'll need for a 3D, it's quite, quite high. And probably the graphic cards cannot, cannot take that. Okay, so um, this is where, where the Sagrada Familia project is right now. So right now I'm in this kind of phase of uh, developing uh, this kind of 3D in a way uh, methods and uh, having this kind of style GAN like network that is able to understand 3D information and also cycle GAN kind of networks to understand 3D information. Thank you everyone. Thanks Daniel, that was, that was, that was amazing. I, I mean, I, I've never heard you lay it out in this way before. I mean, super interesting. And I, I, what I want to stress is that kind of not only we're dealing with images, we're dealing with representation, but there is a process behind this representation that is the kind of the, the GAN generation itself. But 
there is a process behind the process in a sense there is a kind of series of iterations and incremental developments it's not a kind of straightforward thing and i think this was beautifully laid out daniel so thank you so much for your generosity and sharing us with sharing um this experience with, with with us and i you know i think the 3d um aspect is the most the most intriguing of, of all um uh let's let's uh, just uh, let's move on to just what i also want to mention that maybe daniel is also doing one thing i should have mentioned is doing a phd at the anger in, uh, with uh, with patrick so uh, there is a kind of connection here between all these things and what becomes kind of clear is there are a series kind of of pockets of, of of territory where things are happening i mean obviously in austria also at innsbruck there is a work that's going on and where uh, with uh, with gans with claudia uh, pasquero there's some work going on in London. There's some work going on in uh, uh, Sayak. There's some work going on in Michigan with with Matthias. And there's some work going on. I guess you'd call it in Southern California, in Southern uh, Florida now with FIU and FAU. I'd like to um, uh, thanks so much. I'd like to to bring in Matthias, who is um, a long-standing uh, colleague and friend who has been um, working progressively. Um, Matthias, I should say for those who don't know him, um, his name comes from Chile, uh, but he was brought up in in um, in Austria, um, he uh, has a, a practice um, both based in, in, in Michigan, where he is now, and also in, in China. Um, so he's a figure who straddles uh, many different continents and uh, uh, has also also has a PhD from Australia. So I think there's no continent he hasn't been working in. Um, Matthias is uh, um, and been collaborating with uh, the uh, the group in in the computer uh, computer science department in Michigan, particularly with Alexa Carlson, um, and has also is also working on a, on a book. So he's central to the whole debates. And uh, I'd like to to welcome Matthias and invite him to make a presentation. Welcome, Matthias. Hi Neil. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me to do uh, a quick talk at the FIU DDS lectures, uh, Theories of the Digital, uh, especially session six on AI and architectural design. It's really a great pleasure to be here and share a couple of thoughts, thoughts with colleagues and peers. Um, uh, it's really exciting to discuss this new paradigm in architecture. Um, I'm also very happy to present after Daniel, though it's a hard follow up, I have to say, but uh, it also shows how different approaches can be to this new idea on architecture and uh, that shares a variety of different fields. And that's exactly why I'm so excited about it. It's not specifically just a style or a formal a formal idea. There's more happening in the background here that can inform the discipline in a quite deep way. And paradigms have the habit to change once the old paradigm has run its course. So we're going to see how this is going to turn out. Yeah? So the basic interest that, that I would like to share with you is the interrogation of artificial intelligence in regards of two specific criteria, the aspects of the tame problem, things like functionality, performance, utilitarian values, aspects of material culture, and then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, aspects of the wicked problem, as aspects like sensibility, aesthetic, symbolic culture, and so on and so forth. There are many more aspects, uh, for example, things that I'm not gonna discuss today, but that's certainly part of this conversation that needs to be uh, had, uh, which is aspects of the political, economic and ecological considerations that come along with aspects of artificial intelligence in architecture. Now, my main interest is the idea of architecture in the age of post-human perception. So machine vision and their perception of the world and how it can be harnessed for architecture design. Uh, I actually recently proposed the term neural architecture for that, um, which means that neural architecture is the field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of uh, artificial neural networks as a method of designing architecture. So this term is borrowed from the fields of art, uh, where this term has been applied to the artworks of artists such as Mario Klingemann, uh, Sofia Crespo, who was here last week with us. Uh, one of her work, for example, is called Neural Zoo, or also the music of artists such as Databots, Yacht, uh, Holly Herndon. So there's obviously like an emergent cultural um, uh, territory uh, that architecture is starting to be part of. And this new area is asking for a new theory of architecture and for an area of design that is distinctly different and at the same time so closely related to existing knowledge in the architecture discipline. 
uh, for Sandra and myself, this whole trip uh, started in Vienna, of course, um, where we were friends or are still friends with Professor Robert Trappel and Arthur Flexer of the OFI, OFI the Austrian Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and we had uh, conversations with both of them starting 1997 about um, how to use artificial intelligence in architecture. This was purely theoretical and, uh, you know, trying to figure out if there are ways to use them. Somehow at that time, they were, they were basically at the point where they could simulate one neuron to one neuron interaction. So the OFA is one of the oldest institutes of its kind. Um, it's part of the Studiengesellschaft für Kubernetik, um, which is a registered scientific society founded in 1969. In 2006, Sandra and I, and, and, and uh, Arthur Flexer, who you see here in a conversation we recently had, which is also posted on our YouTube channel, um, uh, held the first um, um, workshop on machine learning at the Angewandte um, and from there, it slowly, slowly evolved further. And it really started to take off when we started to collaborate uh, with the um, uh, robotics department and the computer science department of the University of Michigan, who also, the robotics department, uh, in addition, commissioned us uh, to design something in the robot garden. Yeah. And there, this is basically our client for that garden. Um, the robot garden is basically a testing ground for bipedal robots. And I, I actually discussed that with the director of robotics, Jesse Crystal, and I explained to him basically, this is um, architecture uh, for machines by machines. So it was basically designed by a neural network and the machines that are roaming that, gr that ground are using machine vision to perceive that, per that environment. I don't know how good the videos come over here. Um, I hope this is gonna be all right. Um, oh, good. 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 Okay. So the robot garden, the commission basically was asking for a ser series of different geologic features to test the robots. So sandy terrains, rocks, grass, earth, etc. So we created a database with several thousand satellite images. Let me just turn off the sound here for me. Okay. Uh, several different databases of architectural features, such as fountains, columns, etc., and a database of different styles, such as Gothic, Baroque, and so on. And playing with the weights, we started to get a grip of how to use the technique until we got usable results. That was quite a process for us. It was really the first time we tried to apply this. This was late 2018, early 2019, when we started working on this uh, and did a variety of different tests. Um, the, the, the reason why they needed these specific features on that uh, garden, specifically also the steps, was because they were working on the so-called last 100 feet problem, uh, which uh, is a, a problem in terms of delivering, uh, delivering goods uh, with robots to doors and to the entrance of houses and so on. And you see here also like the sort of weird results we also got out of this process, which I really liked a lot, the sort of mistakes and, and mishaps that happened here. Um, it, 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 Patrick mentioned before that it reminds him on things that happened in the 80s. And I do agree that there is this moment of the happy accident that helps in interpreting how this could be utilized as an architectural design device. And we did this water feature and steps also in a way that they can be flooded. So they could also use, uh, for example, you see in Michigan winter, we can do a, a ton of ice there and we can have a robot walk over ice and see how it operates uh, or in, on the wet surfaces in summer and so on. So there's like this, this very visceral moment there where the garden transforms into the swampscape and, and can be used by robots in, in that sort of condition. It's currently under construction. This is the current state at the moment. Uh, we are still working on it. We had to halt it, of course, because of COVID, because certain features are still missing uh, that we call the, the boulders, uh, which were also based on a, a generative adversarial network process where we played around with a variety of features onto uh, particular geometries. And uh, this is a 2D to 3D style transfer technique. So it's, we, are, we are closing into the problem of how to really do these elements in 3D. 
and doing this 2D to 3D style transfer regenerated those boulders that I hope we, we can uh, continue fabricating soon to put them on site, uh, hopefully by spring. But again, to emphasize this, the strangeness of some of these results and the way how they can really inform uh, us as designers. I would have loved to build something like this. Uh, hopefully the next time around, we can do something that doesn't need only ge uh, ge uh, geological features, but maybe something that we can do some spikes or flowers. I don't know exactly what, but it could be interesting. And that was basically the final result. Um, So this was basically our first attempt to build uh, something that came out of one of those processes. Um, and then we participated in a competition in Shenzhen, China. We were invited to participate in this uh, competition for the 24 uh, high school uh, project in Shenzhen, China, um, which is a school basically for around 3,000 students, it's, it's quite an enormous school, more than 100,000 square meters. Um, and I have to say that for this one, we used a completely different approach. We wanted to somehow experiment with the possibility to go away from the image-driven ideas of, of, um, uh, of neural networks that are most widely used. Um, so in particular, and, and Daniel hinted onto that problem too, that there is like this enormous amount of 2D information, but how do we go into 3D? And this is one of our obsessions since the very beginning, as you saw already with the robot garden and the 2D to 3D style transfer we used there. And we used something called an attentional generative adversarial network, uh, which allow attention driven, a multi-stage refined for fine grained text to image generation. So attention guns can synthesize fine-grained details at different subregions of the image by paying attention to the relevant words in the natural language description. In addition, a deep attentional multimodal similarity model computes a fine-grained image text matching loss for training the generator. And it's based on the COCO data sets. It's common objects, uh, it's a common objects um, uh, database which has I think like several hundred thousand, uh, the databases are several hundred thousand examples, which are all labeled uh, and allowed for detailed analysis. Um, and it can visualize that. And um, so you see here the process where we use sentences basically to generate images. Those images then were transformed into um, a, a 3D model. Uh, the, the, conver the conversion into a 3D model was rather like we used a really simple approach. I mean, we, we took those images, we put them into Grasshopper, we used the uh, image mapper and then devised um, an extrusion algorithm that then generated those uh, volumes in different heights in space. And that basically gave us the, 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 the basic volumetric elements of this, of this uh, project. Uh, and we deliberately kept the plans of this project really simple, like super straightforward, as simple as possible. Uh, I mean, it, they work really nicely, but I have to also to say that it, it also unveils one specific problem that we currently have with this kind of work, which is the relationship between interior and exterior, because we are able to generate interiors, we're able to generate exteriors, but somehow simultaneously doing both processes is currently really challenging. And you saw this also in Daniel's work, you see the Sagrada Familia only from the inside, right? Um, I would also like to thank at this point, uh, Bollinger Groman, who were enormously helpful in, in uh, interrogating the structural system of this project and figuring out how we can actually build this um, in terms of the budget given and the, and the quality of uh, um, uh, of construction in this case. So just to give you a little overview of what the project is doing here. Uh, so we're working along a main axis. Um, so I have to say that the, the attentional GAN is really an interesting problem to work on. Um, so it is. It actually has a this this project has a variety of different functions here, right? There's classrooms, uh, large advanced technology fab lab, large public multi-purpose building, 
library, laboratories, PE building, dormitories, out, outdoor sports facilities, and so on and so forth. Um, in the months leading to the competition, we had been experimenting with potential guns already, uh, trying to figure out how to use them. And the, which, uh, the competition seemed like a really good candidate to implement the research in a concrete project that had very specific requirements, right? So the motivation was to explore attention generative adversarial networks as a design technique in architecture that can, be, uh, can somehow found in the desire to interrogate an alternative design methodology that does not rely on images as a starting point, uh, but language. Um, I mean, traditionally, architecture design relies on visual language to initiate a design process. Um, I mean, literally, Patrick mentioned it before. So whether this is be a napkin sketch or a quick doodle in a 3D modeling environment, so it's always a very visual uh, um, action that you that you that you put into designing. Attention GAN explores the information space presented in, in programmatic needs yeah, expressed in written form and transform them into a visual output. Yeah? The visual output can be further processed into three-dimensional models that transport lingual information into fully developed architectural entities. So, um, so as I mentioned, for the last two years, we have been trying to explore methods emerging from computer science that allow us to use neural networks in 3D. Uh, instead of folding 3D into the two-dimensional plane of a two, 2D image and then unfolding them back again into 3D, like for example, the 2D to 3D style transfer we, I mentioned before, uh, the problem with that, that it loses information in the process. So we wanted to create a workflow that works entirely in 3D, thus resisting the Albertian paradigm in creating an abstraction of reality via planned sections and other methods, uh, methods of architectural representation. The attention gun process is still not entirely 3D, uh, but rather something like two and a half D, I would say. Uh, but it was certainly fun exploring how a neural network would respond to a cue such as uh, the building is used for sports, it's colorful and has a crenellated crown. Or another example for a sentence we used was the canary yellow building is a laboratory and is mocking the ground. So you can really become very surreal almost in the way how you're using language and how it starts to generate imagery out of this. So the, the images were fed into a process that recognized color features, extruded volumes depending on the size of, uh, of the color patch and moved them in, in the C direction, uh, which was done set uh, based on a set of rules that we put in place for that. Um, however, this did not produce the final plans. So and this is one of the things that I'm still a little bit struggling with and I hope that we can solve this uh, sooner or later is, is like how to further analyze results out of this process and how we can get it to operate more um, in a complete process. But although the, it would be also a queer, fair question whether this is necessary at all, or if it's really more like the, the human element here to interrogate and explore and interpret the results that are produced by the neural network. Now, as I mentioned before, we are really, really obsessed with finding a methodology that allows us to operate completely in 3D. And uh, we have been working together uh, with Justin Johnson uh, from Michigan Computer Science, who is one, also one of the people involved in Google uh, with the 3D, um, PyTorch 3D. And um, we developed together with him and with Alexa Carlson, uh, uh, the, so uh, a graph CNN that actually allows us to do a couple of interesting things. Um, so the graph CNN or graph convolutional neural networks um, is a powerful neural network architecture for machine learning on graphs. Uh, in fact, they are so powerful that even a randomly initiated two layer uh, graph convolutional neural network can produce useful features uh, or feature representations rather of nodes in networks. So we used so what you see here is a data set of around 1500 models. It is a small data set, admittedly, but this data set was entirely modeled by, my, by me alone. So, and it's divided into two criteria. One is houses and the other one is uh, columns. And the idea, uh, the idea behind this project was, can we create a neural network that is able to generate novel resulting objects that would comply with the sensibility of the original author. Meaning, if I run this neural network, can it generate 
a house or a column where I, as Matthias El Campo, would say, yes, that's a house or column that I would design, but I did not design it. It was done by the neural network. So that's the, the basic provocation behind this, which means creating all these models, labeling all these models. And then again, this is also necessary that me, as Matthias El Campo, labels every single of these models, not somebody else, because it's completely relying on my sensibility as an author. So we, we gave them a variety of different criteria. So we labeled them based on, uh, we call them style A, B, and C. Uh, so the nature of the architectural design process can be described along the lines of the following representational devices, right? The plan and the model. So plans can be considered one of the oldest methods to represent spatial and aesthetic information in an abstract 2D space. However, to be used in the design process of 3D architectural solutions, these representations are inherently limited by the loss of rich information that occurs when compressing the 3D world into a two-dimensional representation. Um, during the first digital turn, as described by Mario Carpo, the sheer amount and availability of models increased dramatically as it became viable to create vast amounts of model variations to explore project alternatives among a much larger range of different physical and creative dimensions. 3D models offer what they design objects appear in real life and can include a wider array of object information that is more easily understandable by non-experts such as exemplifying techniques such as building information modeling, parametric modeling, etc. And what we did here was basically create uh, three criteria in the, in, the, in the labeling process of the database, which was what is the style, what's the aesthetics, and what's the functionality. So do I like it? Don't I like it? Does it work? Does it not work? Yeah. And what kind of style is it? We divided it in, into, into three more general um, style ideas. And I'm not going to go into detail with that. But I can show you that these were some of the results we got out of that process. And these here were quite funny because these are based on a database that I, that I called um, Check Cubism, just because of the features that it has. And so in, in, therefore, it's the ground condition considers that the inherent nature of architectural design and sensibility lies in, negotiate, in the negotiation of 3D space coupled with the organization of voids and spatial components. And so what happened here is basically that the neural network um, and it took some tweaking of the weights, I have to admit, uh, until it resulted in an, in an object that I said, yes, I can use that as a, as a design for a house. And this is what we got at the end. Yeah. Now the question is really, how can a neural network interrogate the inherent sensibility of a specific designer? Yeah, I think we can assume that we can model a designer sensibility as a high dimensional function that can be learned from 3D models and apply to generate novel design solutions. So the design technique whose backbone is the graph convolutional neural network is capable of modeling both the perception and creation of an architectural object. Collect 3D models from the hand of one designer, creating a large data set of models in two distinct categories like houses and columns. And then in order to train a neural network to come up with an additional model solution that are generated using the learned features of the trained network. And that's uh, it's, it's what, what is really exciting to me is that it actually worked. Although I have to admit that because the data set is so small, we need to increase the number of the data set extensively to get to better results or faster results. Let me put it this way. Yeah. Now, this is basically sums up some of the projects that I've been doing recently. Um, we're continuing to work on this graph CNM project um, that we're trying to refine so that we can come up with better solutions. We are working on the problem of interior and exterior in neural networks, uh, which is an additional problem. Uh, and uh, it, this is something that cannot be achieved alone. This is something where the community has to come together and work together on creating the respective databases, uh, interrogate the processes, test the processes. So in, in order to create a group that works on this, late in 2020, uh, Daniel Bolohan, Immanuel Cohen, myself found the Neural Architecture Group that basically interrogates uh, these ideas in, in depth, or tr we try to discuss this more. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, new paradigms have the habit to emerge when the existing paradigm has run its course. But the question is, what is the current paradigm? So what does neural architecture bring to the table in regards to a substantial innovation in the architecture discipline? For one, it critically interrogates the role of the architect in the creative process of architecture design. 
neural architecture embraces the possibility of a design method that is deeply informed by existing information in the form of databases and understands that the artificial modeling of neural processes can aid in harnessing the information in big data. Interestingly, the results do not resemble historic examples. And thus the method is not a repetition of postmodern tropes such as collage, quote, or and iconic assemblies. The result is rather a construct, a frame around, an, around aspects of defamiliarization and estrangement, and that we are able to recognize certain features without it being a copy. So we are really striving away from the idea of glorified curve fitting, like the closer we are to the curve, the more the closer it's going to be to, to, the, to a convincing realistic image. For example, what you see in th this human does not exist. Um, rather striving a little bit away from that curve in order to find the more interesting fringes of the architectural discourse and, and form and morphology and, and so on. And you can find a work of this uh, of the group in the on the webpage aarchitects.org. Um, we are increasing the number of people involved in this uh, in now, so there is more people going to join us, um, and we hope that we can uh, uh, achieve a critical mass to really go ahead and, and explore this um, deeper. And then, in addition, I found the um, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at Taubman College, uh, where we're starting to work with uh, postdocs and PhD students on some of these problems. And as I, and uh, I will shamelessly use this opportunity, of course, also to support the, the, my upcoming book, Neural Architecture, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, which uh, is uh, slated to be published uh, with oral editions uh, fall this year. Yes, and with that, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for listening and giving me the chance to talk about these obsessions. Th thank you, Matthias. Um, uh, uh, I should add that we, actually Matthias and I are doing an, an, an issue of architectural design uh, will be coming out in 2022. And maybe I could shamelessly promote my own book, Architecture in the Age of AI, that will be coming out in October. It seems to be an interesting moment when um, everything is coming together right now. Um, so super interesting. I just wanted to, to add something. I think, um, uh, first of all, that, that I think um, uh, language is so important. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking here of Austria and, and kind of Wittgenstein who came across to, to Cambridge. Um, uh, but I mean, the whole thing about the natural language processing, the GPT-3 project uh, that's led into DALI and, and CLIP and other things, I think that's gonna be a significant sort of shift. And we can also talk about Noam Chomsky and his kind of role within the kind of MIT project. And I just want to mention, since we mentioned Wittgenstein and, and, and Vienna and so on, that we also, another kind of uh, center for this research is the Austrian Institute of, of Technology, where the City Intelligence Lab has been exploring more kind of performative questions. And Theodorus uh, Galanos, who is part of that lab, will be presenting in terms of our, um, our, our, our performance-based. Uh, um... can, I, can I have a set? And a set? Sure. sure. With, a, with a question, it's quite interesting. Picks up from what you're saying when you talk when you met, when you mentioned Chomsky. It, what comes to mind when I see the uh, uh, Matthias's last project there, where he's trying to generate um, novel design solutions which match the kind of sensibility of a particular architect, as well as when I remember when I look back at uh, Daniel's last attempt to and a may do a 3D version of a style gun only based on Sagrada Familia and he's doing his 3D crops. And uh, also, so my reflection is this, I mean, I wanted to ask you both, where wouldn't be um, George Steiny's shape grammar uh, processes deliver a solution? I mean, particularly when I look at Daniel's, these cropped geometries, they're, very, they're already very amorphous and you're getting no crisp form, and then you 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 let the the system kind of try to handle them. Uh, it it might be better to start with a series of models, elements, and of course you would have to abstract some kind of a grammar set of rules. And similar with Matthias, I mean, um, there is in a way what Stein has shown, and, and many others have done that you can do uh, you know un, uh, generate Le Corbusian villas and Palladio villas, and it, it, there's a tradition in, which led to that computational transformation. So I was wondering where this sits. And you might say, well, I mean, these, these grammars are very explicit and simplistic. And in natural language, I agree that we had, um, a, you know, limited success with explicit grammars uh, to have proper 
explicit drummers which function and compete and we had to go into the black box of the neural network. But I wonder if architecture has a level of complexity and whether, you, whether we might get more satisfying results uh, with the shape drummers. It's curious to, to, to compare that. I mean, I know you. That it also makes sense to invest in new processes, full stop. And 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 and, but it's all. I think it's interesting to to compare because the, what you're aiming at the moment is something which I suspect shape gummers would deliver better, quicker. So the thing, just very quickly, Patrick, if you look into the attentional GAN process that we used for this high school project, for example, I mean, we intentionally were mocking this kind of graph, you know shape grammar thing and so on. I mean, we were using like completely ridiculous sentences to create this project. Mm -hmm. Nothing that was informing in like, we didn't take it like literal and say like, let's try mm -hmm. if we can use a neural network to generate something that makes sense if we give it a, a senseful sentence, right? It might, it might not, but this was not the important part in the project. Mm -hmm. It's rather really like mm -hmm. using it, you know, intentionally weird and intentionally, you know, surreal and nonetheless at the end providing a project that works i mean that's the thing that that project or like in terms of its architecture it operates it works it will deliver yeah so basically here's like the the, the thing where you're throwing something into the machine you get an, a, a really exciting and provocative result out of it but the problem we still have is we still have to convert it into a project that can be used and that's mostly manual so to say and yeah, it's not done automated yet yet it might come but not yet. So I think we're I, right for me, I can only st speak for myself here. We're at the moment rather like tweaking those, uh, those techniques and trying to understand how to, do they make sense for our design environment? Not saying, I'm not saying it generally for everyone, it's for our design environment, yeah? And, and so far we are, things are getting better and more exciting. And also you, you remember that problem, you, you talked about the eighties and the nineties. There was also this problem of gaining control over this behemoth of technologies, right? And I think right now we're trying to understand how do we get a specific amount of control over it without losing the interesting part of it. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. interesting. I mean, I mean, I feel that uh, also, I mean, when, when I look at where the breakthrough was with Daniel, if you, if you, when you're working with these, um, um, let's say, uh, agent-based kind of noodle, noodle compositions, uh, maybe it's too abstract and, and amorphous that we actually don't, and if there's sort of correlations and, and classifications, they are, they are not humanly tractable. And therefore we're blind to it, not receptive, and we, we can see a success if there was ever one. And similarly, I think that's the, that's the challenge when with, with some of these abstract images or the, with, with the, these crops as well. And uh, similarly, I don't know, um, I mean, now you explained the bit, it was quite playful what you've done because my question would have been on the on the tension guns is how do you actually, did you just have a ready-made system or you're training it and how do you actually, how, um, how do you build up um, uh, uh, that, 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 what's the design space behind generating from sentences, but also what's the, product, what's, what's the tagging, what's the uh, um, underlying categorization and so on. So, I mean, I think this is interesting. I mean, you, you just toyed with it at the moment seems. But, but um, uh, yeah, that was a question that a question I had, but the, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that for me, there's an underlying tension with, the, with respect to the, the systems uh, and it's in general design. We, we, we want to work with and we rely with, with this kind of interesting mixture of redundancy and, and novelty, let's say, uh, recognizability and, and freshness. And if it tilts too much into the abstract, we, we, just, we just can't grapple. And if it, if, it, if it stays too much within an, an idiom, we, we, we are not stimulated enough and we feel there's a lack of innovation. So, so there's, no, there's a sweet spot perhaps. And that sweet spot is every time different and for different sensibilities. So that's, that's something that you also want to throw in. But, but in my reflection, I think the, the um, again, I think the, the, the shape grammar stuff is something which, which um, is a competitor at the moment, I see, but with respect to some of the intentions. Um, and when you and, and the difference is, I think, when you when you um, trying to generate uh, reproduce your own sensibility um, through this self labeling and so on, uh, um, you you do get into some kind of uh, categorization and so on. Um, but but then you kind of throw it back into the ineffable, into the black box, uh, rather than trying to 
uh, make it an explicit process. Seems to be the case. But and then also when I looked at these ABC categories, I, it was hard to distinguish them. I know that maybe there is nuances there, but but maybe they're yeah. also too nuanced and too abstract and too amorphous as a field. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Just reflections I have in terms of um, uh, responding to what I'm confronted with. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm great. Uh, I'm very curious and supportive, of course, of the overall project. So. I, I, just very quickly, I want to say that I, I agree with most of what you say, Patrick. Uh, mm -hmm. I also have to say that the GraphCNM project is an ongoing research, and we are aware of some of the problems you pointed out, and that we are hard working on getting it to run better. It's just a work in progress. Yeah, so from my perspective, it's also like um, I agree in a way with this kind of like space uh, gra grammar and bring, bring that topic in. Uh, but I think for me, something that I discovered when I started to work with kind of networks, I just realized in a way how complex the entire design process is, because yeah. you're you're starting from one end and you're saying, okay, I'm going to approach approach design from this perspective, and then suddenly you realize how many interconnected things are there, and suddenly you're addressing design, but you are aware that actually you are ignoring a lot of super important things in design. Yeah? So like you were saying about uh, space grammar is the same thing. So there, there probably you need a, a, a graph can or something to, to learn that kind of idea. And then maybe you have to connect it with something else from there on. And then also, for example, I think I was mentioning in, in my presentation also, the reason why I'm going with agent-based systems is just that it's a system that is homogeneous enough to be able to work with it, yeah? So the same reason it's also, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of um, iterations being done with voxels because it's a type of geometrical system that allows you to have this kind of homogeneous data. While if you just have meshes, meshes is very hard to have a mesh that has exactly the same structures, the same number of vertices and so on. Yeah? And then this kind of networks that cannot really learn uh, correctly things. So I think we have certain challenges and we have to find in a way. And I think from my perspective, it's also like, we should not throw away in a way everything that we learned till now in architecture and process. What and I feel so is important. I mean, you said it at the beginning, uh, Daniel, that this is a we we have an augmentation of our own kind of design exploration, yeah. and uh, we are very strongly interfacing. Whether we're labeling, whether we're selecting, whether we whether we where, where where we see success, and so we need to reflect on our own kind of, let's say. Um, Matthias was saying post human perception, but in actual fact, we have to reflect on our own perceptual uh, uh, um, um, cognitive capacities. I mean, I was thinking, I mean, the Gestalt psychology is very important. What do we see? Differences that make a difference. Uh, you know, the, the Gestalt, we, we're very strongly sensitive to this, various dimensional uh, differentiations we, we, we don't pick up. We're kind of topological engines in a way, but with a lot of, but still with this Gestalt kind of. Um, 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 switches as well. And it, so so there, since we're so closely tying in ourselves into the process a, a, and, and you talking to neuroscience and cognitive science and so on, reflection of what, how we actually interface and uh, how we, um, what we bring as supercomputers uh, into the mix is very important as well so that we can calibrate but, so that we set up the heuristics right. That, for instance, I, I, when, when I see you working with these amorphous swarms of, of uh, noodles, let's say, I know you, you're not going to succeed uh, because we can never tell. <laughs> uh, a, 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 there's no differentiation. It's just an, an endless soup. Uh, so, 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 so that will be strategic heuristic setting when, when, we, when we reflect on our own kind of cognitive, um, 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 let's say, bias and capacities. Anyway, so so thanks. I, Patrick. Want to, I don't want to use it, but I think that's, no, that's, this, this is actually there are a lot of really interesting ideas that have been thrown up today. Um, I just want to mention to, to you, Patrick, that the creative GANs, creative adversarial networks are doing exactly what you're talking about, working within a kind of genre, uh, but then trying to kind of like push it a bit further. It, it's uh, that's uh, yeah. Ahmed Amalgam is doing that. Also, um, uh, 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 I mean, there are a number of comments that Matthias's thing pr pr provoked. Interesting comments about authorship. Um, I think the question about meaning. You know, does I know anything about meaning? And, and and so on. I would just simply say that with also the the GPT three discussion, it was super interesting in the way that can feed in. But I don't want to mention that now because we want to move into Emmanuel Code to his presentation. Um, and I want to apologize for Emmanuel Code because he's in Singapore, and Singapore it's extremely late at night. Um, so thank you so much for. 
for staying up this late, Emmanuel. So please go. Uh, can I have one very quick question for, for, for Daniel? Because he used the phrase semantic representation learning. And I was curious what concept of semantics is at play in your work, if, if, if any. Uh, in what sense? I don't understand your question. You, you used the phrase at the beginning, semantic representation learning. Yeah. So I'm I'm talking mostly about like semantic level of uh, of Sagrada Familia, so the language of it, yeah, the compositional language of it, and how you learn that and translate it then into a different composition. Okay, fair enough. All right, sorry, move on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So Emmanuel, uh, please go ahead. I just want to say that well, we've been joined by Sanford Quinter and Philip Beasley. So we've got a fantastic group here. So welcome, um, Emmanuel. Please go ahead. Please. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, just trying to share my screen now. Um, yeah, can, can you see my slide now? Yeah? We can see two Are you able to see my slide? We can see two slides. Oh, it's the wrong one, probably. Uh, uh, let me try again. The uh, Probably the wrong screen. Yeah, um, we can just, just see one okay. screen now. Yeah, okay. Is this right? Uh, yes. One slide, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, right, thanks, Neil, uh, for the invitation. I hope I could stay sharp. <laughs> it's midnight now in Singapore, actually. But yeah, so today's project uh, will mainly include the ones that, uh, that I'm currently developing in, in my lab uh, in Singapore called architecture, uh, Artificial Architecture, where, where I teach uh, currently, and also some projects uh, during my PhD uh, at EPFL in Switzerland. So majority of the work is uh, on generating 3D forms uh, with AI. Uh, again, also equally unashamedly, I would also like to promote <laughs> my new book, which has been published uh, very recently, uh, late 2020, uh, called Artificial Architecture, uh, Intelligence and Design. <clears throat> so uh, essentially it's a, a reflection on the relationship between architecture and AI through the overlapping lenses of both histories. So looking at the AI and architecture, digital architecture as well, and see some kind of uh, interesting synergy <clears throat> as a way to reconceptualize uh, our discipline somehow. So I'll flash this same QR code later on at the end of the presentation, yeah. Um, so what is uh, something in architecture? I, I, I had it as my title. Uh, so personally, this is a fundamental question that has implication on how one might perceive or in computational term encode and generate or decode architectural form using machine learning and deep learning. So as we can see on this slide, I'm alluding to this shift from drawing to or CADing in fact, to sampling, yeah. So the aesthetics of sampling. So I've tried to do similarly when I wrote the 2019 article, um, the, the issue edited by Jules uh, Retson, called the discrete, but in, in that particular one, I'm, um, the article is entitled discrete samplings, uh, which I, later on I'll elaborate a bit more, not from a discrete sense of the discourse, but from through the lenses of machine learning from discrete sampling. So arguably this shift towards um, sampling could already be found in the late 1960s, especially the Super Studios histogram of architecture. Basically uh, a small catalog, 30 voxel looking like forms, you could call it actually a training set. So that they used to generate similar yet different looking forms across scales of cities, architecture, furniture, products, um, conceptually, yeah. Uh, I've, in fact, I, I was really inspired by their seemingly uh, prophetic words. Um, so the problem was to step further and further away from these activities of design, adopting perhaps the theory of the least effort amidst a generalized reductive process. Later, furniture, environments, architecture, and more were effortlessly generated from the histogram catalog. The histogram were also the architect's uh, tombs, uh, which I think resonate with uh, Neil's uh, uh, last session of, of this uh, series, the death of the architect. The 3D GAN interpolation sequences uh, that you saw just now between the chairs and buildings in, in the last three slides, in fact, serve as a, uh, the basis for this uh, AI art project that uh, was recently featured at the 2020 NeurIPS uh, online art exhibition um, called Machine Learning and Creativity. 
So uh, this is my uh, humble uh, uh, submission. Um, in a way, it is inspired by the histogram. Um, in, in that sense, it's not about, the chair is not about structural optimization, which is pretty much the entire history of, you know, kind of making chairs or in computational sense, uh, but rather a computational subversion of such a form finding paradigm where it is more about exploration than necessarily structurally coherent. So I've, I've mostly been experimenting with two types of sampling found in deep generative models. One, the adversarial, or you could call it the GAN sampling. The other, autoregressive, which is uh, slightly more neglected uh, in general discourse. Um, the probabilistic chair is of the former. As a quick comparison, the adversarial uh, sampling is, uh, it can't actually do discrete. So it's continuous, is based on an estimation of uh, the implicit density. And it has a latent space and is fast. It's a single, you generate the whole image directly. Whereas the autoregressive sampling is kind of the opposite in that sense. It's, it could do continuous, but it's more comfortable in the discrete world. And it is estimating an explicit uh, density of the given data set. And it doesn't have a latent space. And it's slow because it is a fit forward uh, network that does one thing at a time, one pixel at a time, for instance, um, which I'm going to elaborate. Uh, so in, in other words, the adversarial sampling is like machine hallucination with latent space, whereas the autoregressive sampling is machine hallucination without a latent space. <clears throat> so let's start with the first uh, and the, the more uh, um, familiar one. The, uh, the first series that I would like to sh this, uh, show, uh, present is the probabilistic histogram architecture, which is again linked to my interest in the super studio work. Uh, within this series is uh, this other ongoing government funded research project, uh, which I'm the uh, PI. Uh, and in a way it is an extension of the probabilistic chair in the new RIPS uh, entry, but at the national level with 3D buildings, um, not chairs, uh, real build buildings uh, in, in the uh, 3D representation and semantics. So if we slice across the, uh, a slice of the data set, this is this tiny island in Singapore. Uh, th these are actually the uh, extracted, uh, uh, the fo not footprints, the 3D model in fact. The, these are the geolocated buildings shown here in the 3D representation. Uh, some kind of a zoom in here. It's a bit small now. Um, as I mentioned, the large scale project, which is uh, ongoing, uh, there are lots of glitches at the moment. So instead of for greater legibility, I will instead present a voxel based version of the same project. Here's a snapshot of the data set of buildings used for the training as voxels. So thousands of them, uh, voxelized, shown in a similar fashion as a super studio histogram architecture. So here we see the interpolation within the 3D GAN latent space between several possible uh, residential blocks in Singapore in 3D. Uh, the latent space is trained solely with the data sets of buildings. So there's no interpolation between different classes of stuff. On the right one could actually see the underlying changing probability of each building voxel. For those who, are, who have ever trained a GAN model, we'll know whether 2D or 3D, we'll know about the issue of uh, mode collapse which other regressive model doesn't suffer from. But anyway, that's a separate question, uh, discussion. But if we were to conceptually flip this argument as one that is about a notion of strongly and weakly form, sample forms, in a way we could see that the weaker version, which is the one that suffers from more collapse, is the archetypal form that insists on converging that way and, and refuses to diversify from a kind of, a, uh, yeah, so again, the underlying probability distribution, we could see that is very not confident for the mode collapse version where you see lots of light colored uh, boxes which represent the, the uh, um, percentages of the softmax uh, activation outputs from the last layer. Uh, a related 3D GAN voxel project uh, first co-developed with my ex-master student uh, it's, it forms actually well, one of the research strands in, in augmented museums, something that I'm personally interested in. 
Uh, the most recent publication on this topic of augmented uh, museum could be found in the Kadra from last year, Kadra, Kadra paper. Specifically for this project, it concerns finding architectural means to actually realize such a 3D GAN base in the related building reconfiguration dynamically. Um, the animation that I saw just now, how do we actually implement that? Uh, is currently being developed uh, in the physical form. Uh, currently, there isn't a physical form. So uh, for this 2021 Art and AI Festival in Singapore, which is the first, uh, happy to uh, share that uh, sometime in, in mid-year, and I'm co-curating um, this uh, project. So the, this, this particular uh, project uh, that will be developed further essentially is an end-to-end -end crowdsourcing and GAN co-creation mechanism. So on the top, you see, on the left uh, image, uh, you see the process. On the one hand, you have uh, crowdsource uh, models. And in this next phase is for the 3D GAN model to learn all of these uh, inputs and then um, able to create a latent space. And from there, one could start to think about the construction of logic where I think in the next slide I will show. And, and in fact, there's an interface that does that. So the greater detail of the project is in, in this case, the robotic logistic for the reconfiguration. If we really gonna have this uh, voxel discrete uh, building, how do we actually move them? So using the probability distribution of the voxel as a proxy of when to change part of the building, kind of trying to extend the, the uh, generator or the, the farm palace in that sense, but uh, using uh, autonomous uh, robotics. Um, the second series of projects called Before After Architecture is, uh, is a funny project in the sense that I'm often curious about with those AI application for editing faces. Uh, one of the project in this uh, Before and After series is the AI face set, um, specifically looking at how to oldify or youngify a facade uh, instead of a face. We know that now even Photoshop uh, has that new, this beta function for uh, this neural function to change the face of a person to, make, to look, make him or her look younger or older. So the idea is to reflect such a potential in architectural design. What, what does it really mean to oldify or youngify? Does it even make sense? Uh, this short clip uh, showing an initial prototype demo as part of the research, um, of course, with the assistance of my interns and students. Um, so the idea is if we could kind of project the future, which is older buildings, uh, we could actually identify something. So we could easily imagine this with a, another classification model that allows us to identify uh, how a building might deteriorate, highly speculative. Uh, funny enough for the youngified version, it tends to be a kind of a clean up wall, almost very modern looking without decoration because it's always, you know, nicely repainted wall, well, without texture. Uh, some of the outputs from, from this uh, is a condition again. Um, is, so for instance, in this case, the left image is the input, the right image is the um, oldified version, literally. Um, from oldifying and youngifying, uh, we now look at this concept in architecture, the addition and alteration, or plastic surgery for a facade. Cosmetic surgery for a facade instead of a face. What does it really mean? Um, so these are some of the 3D print uh, of the generated model from this project. This project is, this is a latent space, but in parallel, in the sense that it always has a counterpart of the after. Because we know that conceptually, we cannot train a cycle gun simply by saying source A is before, source B is after. It just doesn't work because after could look like before, there isn't this kind of a very clear visual uh, uh, characteristics. So in this case, it is about exploring the possibility of the um, learning a, a pair, right? And see whether the AI model could somehow figure out what might be a reasonable alteration or addition. So these are the, some, some of the results of the before and after. Um, so every time the machine generate uh, this pair of images, they will look similar, but always in a renovated or altered 
uh, way, um, but plausible. And if we look uh, further, if we analyze it, like really look hard in at those images, we, we could see some uh, interesting repertoire of architectural maneuvers, just, such as rearranging the facade, the horizontal or vertical extension, merging, dividing the parts of the composition, adding or scaling. So th there are interesting moves that architects may use these. Um, not only can we look at the before and after, we could begin to infer the interior configuration, the adjacent uh, interior. So in this case, a 3D printed version of the before and after, suggesting that there are potentially different uh, interior circulation from, from that. Um, a fun project that emerged out of the creative machine learning course that I taught last autumn. In fact, I started this new course at SUTD and I'm very happy to be able to do that, given the opportunity to do that, in fact, uh, which falls under the series of deep learning of fiction, fictional spaces uh, as architecture proxy. Uh, so this funny project is to make the AI watch uh, anime films, uh, 10 of them. Uh, some may be very familiar, the moving castle, for instance. And the AI mod is able to generate unseen well, the very fact is fictional. We are in, and yet we are generating this fictional version of the fiction. Uh, I find it quite interesting. Uh, and in this case, it's specific to the style of uh, Hayao Miyazaki the, of the um, Japanese studio uh, Ghibli. So we see that on, on the left is actually, in this case, style again, uh, on, on, on the left is uh, the pre-trained uh, model is actually based on the car. So you get you sometimes see strange floating vehicle like thing. Whereas on the right is, is, is based on the buildings. So it has some coherence, but we see that the style has been pretty much retained. Um, uh, some snapshots of the outputs, uh, quite plausible uh, fictional uh, spaces. And what happened next is to um, kind of inject this uh, into text uh, model and then ask a person to write what they see in the image. So in a sense, to try to understand what the human and the machine is understanding or perceiving from the image. Of course, the into text caption models is actually quite weak, uh, but still interesting. If you, for instance, look at the top, the sorry, the bottom right image, we see that um, the machine says it's a house with a wooden bench in the front of it, which clearly is perspectively uh, wrong, but perspectively wrong in the sense a human would say is a residential building clad in terracotta next to a pedicure with a path cutting across. So um, quite interesting uh, since we're talking about language. Um, this other fictional project is the Serpentine Pavilion 2020, which is essentially looking at uh, having a training set of uh, Serpentine Pavilion for the past 20 years. And of course we know that because of the COVID, um, 2020 doesn't quite exist. So the idea is to train uh, these images to somehow see if there is, sometimes you see John Novell, sometimes you see um, different architects, like in this one, in this case, the red one, um, or Peter Zumthor, for instance, you see some characteristics uh, of certain projects. And it's interesting because we are so used to this exemplar project that it, it triggers that, that association, uh, even despite the fact that the, the form may not exactly be the same, but the texture, like here we see uh, So Fujimoto on the left. And sometimes you get strange combination, uh, say on the top or the bottom, you have different architects. I, I think the bottom on the left is uh, OMA, for instance, so they run a bit. Um, so the idea is to, uh, in this case, learn exemplar uh, architect, architecture in our, typically as architecture student, we look at these very important buildings. Um, should just move on. So some examples of the generated images, uh, we see, um, yeah, quite a few strange uh, things going on here also. And what happened next is to then try to ask the machine to classify. 
So what I was just doing uh, when I was in the previous slide, I was trying to say, okay, when I see this red thing is Jean Nouvel. Could a machine do that also? And what's the use of that? I don't know, it's, it's highly speculative, but what if you could do that also? So the idea is to plug this efficient net classification model and then predict uh, which year and, and which what percentage uh, do you recognize it as uh, John Nouvel or, or the Ito? So uh, the opacity of the image uh, illustrate. So on the left, you have a column of uh, synthesized images. And on the right, you see, well, funny enough, the first row says that it's 100% confident that it's a Van Gary, which is, uh, well, I don't know, maybe the form. But anyway, so this is some of our experiment. Let's kind of move on to this autoregressive sampling, the kind of a neglected child uh, in the generative model family. Um, so I, I was looking at this thing initially because I was really interested in the discrete, but not in the sense uh, of the general discourse, but as a necessary way to encode form and therefore make machine able to learn them. So discrete in the sense, if you think about text, discrete in the sense that we have the alphabets, we can't go beyond the ABC, right? So there is this idea of uh, classes, not classes, but discrete set. Um, so on a more architectural note, in this case, the 3D, uh, three-dimensional uh, model of uh, Barcelona Pavilion by Ms. Van der Rohn, the roof is in this case removed just so that we can see the interior spatial configuration. So in a similar autoregressive manner, this is generated based on, uh, based on Markov process in the sense that which is the case for autoregressive, whereas for, again, it doesn't require a Markov process, um, um, and this, which is also why um, the autoregressive model perform quite well uh, small data sets and able to generate, uh, in this case, almost like a no-stop city of uh, Barcelona Pavilion. And uh, so let's see what's going on here. Um, the pavilion is discretized quantize, which is what you in fact would do when you kind of feed a neural network, right? If you do text, for instance, you have to do the one hot encoding, for instance, you, you basically have them as a set. So the idea is to do some, what you do in the signal processing, right? You discretize and quantize it, which is actually the word sampling. Uh, so meaning notions of objects is ignored here, giving way to a convolutional perspective. So if we look at the 3D distribute, uh, the, the sets, of course, I'm not showing the convolution version of it, but let's say we have this set. The idea is to uh, think about, so using this more famous example, right, where everybody is familiar, the original Barcelona Pavilion is understood typically in such a way. You have planes, you have objects, object in the sense that you have walls, you have glass, you have the floor and the pool. But if we take it from a resolutional point of view, so just like the receptive field of the neural networks, you have the three by three, five by five, or whatsoever. So what if we do the same thing? What if we look at in a way like the machine convolutionally? So if we do a two by two meter, we get something like this. If we do a 0 0.5 by 0 0.5, we get something like this. Um, and if we put them together, you have um, these sets of uh, possible um, set, discrete set. And a generated instance based on say, just purely uniform probability distribution, even without a uh, machine learning, whatever, just do uniform probability distribution, you get nonsense here. Because every set, every module in the set has the same probability of appearing. And if you generate the, in this case, uh, we take the true frequency count of each cell states, uh, but without, without sampling, convolutionally, meaning looking at the spa spatial relation, we get also nonsense. And here we begin to look at the um, horizontal. So in, for instance, in autoregressive models, you look at your predecessors. So you look at a predecessor, but you could choose which predecessor to look at. So you look at the, the horizontal predecessor, for instance, then this is what you get because you ignore whatever relations uh, vertically. Likewise, if you just look at your vertical predecessor, you get this thing, which is highly artificial kind of bias. But if we start to consider an alteration of such a uh, receptive field that is inclusive um, of all the predecessor, um, then we see some legibility emerging here. 
we start to see some steps. Okay, fine. We have the bench that is always next to the wall. We have some freestanding columns. Um, and then we look at here, uh, in, in this case, we also see some nice uh, solitary bench with a backrest of the wall, for instance, over, over here. <clears throat> but we see this Miesian thing going on here, or well, maybe in a computational sense of the word. And if we look even deeper, why it became like this? Because it has a biasness. So in this case, I'm just kind of quickly showing it for with the examples. The, the, the biasness uh, of this autoregressive thing that we inject into that create this uh, contiguous uh, uh, inference um, uh, bias. So some example of the general outputs uh, and the surrounding the design here, we see uh, the bias has been loosened and therefore they, they look increasingly different. Uh, nonetheless, it, it accomplished the idea to somehow uh, have different but similar looking ones. So if we look at another classic in architecture, the Maison Domino, uh, but with a twist. So we know it's kind of sum up the five points of architecture. What it, what it, so in, in this case, to kind of do an experiment with autoregressive models is, um, what if you have a Maison Domino B, which is basically no free facade, no columns, sheer walls, and and how could we play this game uh, to encode the form? So in this case, if we encode it uh, from a kind of a three by three by three way of thinking, we get about 500 unique, uh, un unique patterns. Um, and if we go higher, just like the Barcelona Pavilion, we go five by five by five, for instance, we get 3,000, about 3,500 unique voxel patterns. And, and this is supposedly a, a complete set of the Maison de A. So with that, once we understand, um, we kind of decompose and kind of compute the probability distribution based on in, in an autoregressive manner, we could actually do uh, arithmetic, not in latent space, but in probabilistic space. So we could say we can add this and this, we get something like this. Fine, it's not amazing looking, but it's the idea, right? We could then subtract also likewise. And similarly, if we play with the receptive field, we could also do something quite different. Uh, in this case, having kind of uh, bigger forms. In, in a similar sense, if we look at the uh, Ricardo Bofield project, if we sample just two staircases, uh, I call it uh, La Morella Roja A and the, uh, the zigzag staircase and the spiral staircase, uh, we could also do something at, at a much uh, higher level uh, of in details. Here again, we still could actually combine them. Uh, the different columns um, of borders represent uh, different receptive fields. And to kind of uh, wrap up is uh, this slide shows some of the work from the AA Shanghai Business School between 2016 and 2018, where I was back then teaching a, a, as a unit master. Um, I think probably Neil or Patrick or Matthias might be in one of those reviews uh, in, in this. Well, Tom Verbus was inviting everyone. Uh, so starting with uh, something really simple in the beginning, uh, just because we know that in 2015, the nearest style transfer, style transfer appeared. So in 2016, I was just kind of exploring, really curious of what does it mean to combine, for instance, Pudong and Pussy, um, and also combine different floor plans. And in 2017, um, this uh, neural style semantics transfer appears in 2016. So 2017, I was kind of playing with it and see what can we get out of it. It's, it's kind of like the pix to pix but not again, uh, using the same optimization concept as in the original neural style transfer from uh, Getz. Uh, some of the, this this really old 2016, uh, of we get <laughs> rubbish, right? Uh, but this is the in, in, in initial experiment in 2016, uh, trying to figure out how we could, well, back then Psychogang wasn't there yet, I think. So back then was trying to see if we, if we conceive the style and the content as two different, um, two different, two different design, for instance, what can we get out of it, right? So on the right, we see some uh, kind of more dense development yeah, probably not very legible, I might say. Uh, so example of the new semantic style transfer from uh, uh, Sean Penda uh, from 2016, 
uh, has the same idea. Is it actually changing? Okay, so um, as I say, it's not again, it's a, but it's like a pixel to pixel in the sense that you could inject semantics, which is basically annotation, uh, maybe in, in, in that sense, answering Patrick's question. Um, so th these are the uh, videos. Um, and anyway, so there are actually more projects. Uh, this uh, specific website that I set up, just focusing on examples of machine learning and deep learning for AI and architecture um, could be found here. And uh, yeah, lastly, <laughs> again, the promotion. Thanks. Yeah. Daniel, thank you. That was that must be a terrific um, set of presentations. We, we, we typically we'd finish it at, um, at, at, at coming up in, in, in a couple of minutes, but I, I just want to leave it open for a bit longer because um, there are all sorts of um, potential things that have been generated by this. Um, uh, questions have been raised by that. I know that Marina has a question for uh, for Daniel or maybe Matthias, but let me start. Anybody does anyone have a question for Emmanuel? Because it's it's half past twelve midnight. Patrick. Yes, very briefly, no, it's just more of a comment. I mean, um, it seems to me, I was mentioning earlier, we need to be quite conscious in terms of the, which um, examples we're choosing and how we uh, encode them. For, for instance, I thought when you did the Singapore uh, tower blocks, I was curious that you went for a kind of uh, uni, a, a little, a relatively small voxel, which generates a lot of noise in the facade, but isn't adding to anything. So that much, a much larger, cruder, module, which is maybe an elongated one, would have been better. The other thought was, um, I had was when, and, and how we choose the example. So when the Barcelona Pavilion uh, example is actually quite strong and quite successful, and the Maison Domini thing fl flopped. And I guess it has to do with the, com the, the, the nice degree of complexity in the Barcelona Pavilion that you within a single object, you can kind of make these subsamples and then if you have a, have a, a kind of probabilistic correlated with respect to neighbor relations that a uh, um, 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 logic, it's nearly like a shape gamma, you generate a lot of beautiful versions, uh, which we recognize as, uh, uh, as a kind of a, the style or mist of that period style composition. Whereas in Maison Domini, if you have only two very simplistic things uh, um, and, 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 and all the results we, we, we don't, we can't recognize as something meaningful. So, so this is quite <laughs> strategic in a way. You could, you could, in a way, you could set up a project uh, with the wrong heuristics and you, and, and you generate a kind of a lot of work for a flop. But, but so that is just a reflection. We're trying to understand what works and doesn't work and why it works and why it doesn't work and so on. And we also, we need to rely in a sense on, on perhaps a certain familiarity with the type of composition we would do and recognize. And it, it's curious that they, this is quite successful and there were variations where in the, there were some groups where you, you ended up with a lot of closed volumes, which are not mis like uh, and wonder how we, we, where that came from. But anyway, these are my just kind of quick comments on, on you did a lot of interesting experiments and, and, and some, some, some flops and I wonder why you, you, you know, whether you're critically appraising that, why they, we, they were unsuccessful experiments. Yeah, actually, th thanks, Patrick. Uh, yes, in fact, the, the Barcelona Pavilion is, is more successful, clearly, compared to Maison Domino. It's also because Maison Domino is the problem with the autoregressive method is that it, it doesn't scale because it's doing one at a time. So for Gen, it is like, boom, you have an image done. Whereas for autogressive is based on a Markov idea, right? Where you, you do one at a time. So it's, it's not scalable. So that's the issue that why I suppose it show up clearly in the Mesa Domino. Uh, whereas for the uh, first question is that, because it's an in-progress project. So I thought I should show the Voxel version, but the, the, the idea is to use point cloud and also doing reprojections. So you extract uh, the images and then you reproject and that, it's kind of a, it's not 2.5D, it's just a quick way to create 3D model without uh, this having thousands and thousands of point clouds or voxels, which is not scalable again. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, I thought it might be interesting because once I showed this maze on Domino to some, a friend, a colleague, in, I mean, he's an engineer, but he knows about straight grammars. And he said, is this straight grammar? No. I mean, this is like, 
this is a humiliation, right? I was trying exactly something to do with Shaker. Right? So, uh, but somehow it has that look. So is, uh, and, and I thought what you mentioned about this having this in 2011, there was an article, this discussion between Chomsky and uh, Peter Novik, the Google uh, head of research, talking about this idea of uh, having grammar, having rules, whereas Peter Novik is really going for this statistical approach to language. And he's saying that it's more successful based on what they managed to achieve in Google, for instance. So which is, I think it's easier to link back to the shiny shape grammar and the more statistical approach that I think generally we're all going for right now. So, I mean, um, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Manuel. That's fantastic. Um, I, uh, I, I know there's a question from, from Marina um, who wants to ask one. Um, uh, we've got about, let's say we've got we've got to finish in 25 minutes time at the very most. Emmanuel, if you need to go, please go. But thank you for this tremendous contribution. It's been a fabulous mix today. Uh, Marina. Yes, hello everyone. I'm here from Argentina and thank you for this amazing presentation and also for all these comments from, uh, from Patrick and on the chat there are like super amazing comments about uh, what you presented. And uh, I want to, to talk about something that we were discussing yesterday in our digital future uh, session uh, with uh, Maria Kutsova and also was there Neil and Eric Goldmer. And we were talking about the figure of the hacker. And uh, there is maybe one figure like a, a radical intellectual in a way. And I wanted to, to ask you like, uh, in, the, in the terms of a hacker, maybe because you were mentioning, you, know, you were discussing about certain ideas about authorship. And in, from this point of view, it's like if it's an author, it's not an, a centralized author. It's more uh, like it, it has like more that this uh, bottom up logic that um, Neil was mentioning about um, also related with the Manuel de Landa theory or, or theories. So uh, uh, in these terms, uh, the, uh, the authority is more dispersed and it's more about connectedness and uh, maybe a certain exchange. But uh, at the same time, uh, it's um, challenging our, uh, the boundaries of our disciplines. So we cannot refer to ourselves uh, only as architects because uh, in terms of the way you are working uh, with artificial intelligence, even the, what Daniel mentioned about this kind of hybridization between different gangs, for example, or the use of, of these kind of strategies or how you, in a way, uh, start to manipulate with a specific um, objective what you do. I believe that in that terms, it's more like a hacker work. Maybe you can contradict me and say that it's not. Um, but uh, in a way, uh, my, my question, could be like, uh, how can we hack the preconception that we have about uh, special representation? Because it, it sounds like, uh, or in a way, what I could uh, listen from your concern, Daniel, and also Matthias' concern is about how can we specialize or, or give a volume or a shape of uh, these images that you are working. Uh, but in a way, this is also restrictive because we are forgetting, for example, tight dimension and also Patrick was mentioning topological spaces and so on. So it's like if we try to uh, understand space in a three-dimensional representation like X, Y, and Z, we are uh, maybe not paying attention or not to see the potents or the possibilities that uh, the artificial intelligence is showing us. So my question could be that, like, how do you think that we can and rethink our Cartesian understanding of space through artificial intelligence, if you see it in some way with all your diagrams, with information, and because your presentation was amazing in terms of process. So thank you. Um, for me, I'm just thinking like, you know, just the fact that we are using this kind of technology, I think is going to challenge a lot of things that we, we think about the way we design. Also this kind of idea, you know, that we as designers, we are somehow unique and we have our own like uh, genius or something. I think we will soon realize that we are just copying a lot of things from everyone. And, you know, uh, AI is going to, I mean, I know that architects, they like to claim that they are super original, but in fact, we are always copying ideas from here, from there, and then we interpret them and 
create our own design. So I think that's going to be something that, you know, is going to be, you know, that kind of idea is going to be obsolete. So probably also this kind of idea of, of this, of spaces, yeah, this kind of conceptions that we have, probably they are going to be challenged, yeah. But I think it's still in a way important for us to, uh, to really uh, um, be critical in a way how we are using certain things, yeah. Like uh, I, I totally agree with Patrick with uh, the shape grammar and stuff like that. Like how we bring in a way those kind of ideas in. I think we should not in a way uh, uh, throw away all the progress that was made till now with all this kind of computation in architecture. But uh, on contrary, we have to actually augment it and uh, further create the processes even more intelligent, yeah. Uh, but I think it's a super huge challenge right now, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the three presentations, I think they show, even the three presentation, which are like super wide, like, you know, a lot of uh, material covered, I think they still don't show the entire picture of everything that it's architecture, yeah. So even this range that it was presented today is already super wide, yeah. But even like this, I think uh, there are so many topics that, need to be addressed in a way to really make the claim that, yeah, whatever architecture you're generating with AI, it's actually really uh, super intelligent, yeah. Maybe just a, a quick point to that, um, the question of authorship and so on. But I mean, first of all, um, I was reminded about that Picasso quote, you know, good artists copy, great artists steal. So basically what these machines are currently doing, they're helping us to steal some stuff and transform it hopefully into something new. I agree with Daniel that, you know, the, the sentiment in the architecture circles that we are all like geniuses and, you know, the creativity of the soul genius, which is a profoundly romantic idea from the 19th century, actually, that has run its course completely already. Yeah. Um, it's highly questionable, uh, especially in the in 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 view of what we're learning, what we're learning now about intelligence and perception and memory and all these sort of things. As soon as you start to understand a little bit better how your creative process actually works, which of course partially is still uh, you know occluded from our perception, um, it already starts to. I'm not, I wouldn't say that the machines are helping us to, to copy things, but they're rather trying, they're, they're highly, um, or the results are highly inspirational in that how they can provoke our human mind to create something interesting out of it. Because it's still, the human mind is still needed to perceive what the machine produces and thus being provoked to create a reaction on that. And, you know, I'm propagating now this is architecture. Somebody else who has no idea about architecture wouldn't probably even put our images into the category of architecture. Yeah. So it is, it, it's like the same thing like Duchamp. Yeah. Once Duchamp proclaimed it's a piece of art, that piece of art is a piece of art. Yeah. It, 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 it gets a different value. Yeah. And in, in a way, uh, yes. Uh, I mentioned before that um, we're not fully under control of what those processes are producing. Yeah, and it's good that we're not completely under control because that starts to provoke questions about what is the sensibility created? How does it respond to contemporary culture? Which kind of uh, repercussions studies does it have for authorship? I mean, Foucault, for example, uh, proposed that authorship does not lie in the text that an ri that author writes, but in the language. Yeah, in that, so meaning that the text itself has no authorship. Yeah. So in a, in a sense, what we are creating with neural networks has a similar problem. Like where is the authorship of what we're creating there? Is it in the processes that we apply? Is it in the databases that we use? Is it in the programmer who programmed the code? Is it in the architect who interprets the imagery at the end and you know, pro proclaims it to be architecture? So there's like a whole you know, enormous uh, pile of things happening here that are, Metaphysical problems, ontological problems, uh, problems of of uh, uh, of the epistemology that follows up on that sort of uh, creation of knowledge, yeah, or creation of whatever comes out of it. So there's like a, I think it's highly interesting. We're in, we're experiencing a very provocative uh, moment in terms of what it means for theory, what it means for the discourse of architecture. If we are actually able to mine through three thousand years of architectural production and then use that as a, as, a, as a machine to produce architecture, whatever that means, yeah? Uh, whatever the term architecture means, because I think like every single one of us probably has a different def definition of what architecture actually is. Uh, again, a nice quote from Hans Hollein, everything is architecture, yeah? So 
that that actually includes whatever we, the, the processes that we're cr currently using produces at the end of the day. But it's an ongoing conversation. I don't think I have like a clear answer to your question, Marina. Yeah. And maybe that's the exciting part of it that I don't have a clear answer to that. Uh, Matthias, um, do you think what I observe at the three of us also, uh, although it's described or it was described as speculative work, but I think uh, the three of us, we all have like uh, quite strong connection to practice also, no? So uh, also Emmanuel, you also have like connection with practice and also Matthias, I also have. So um, in a way, why do I need to go towards 3D and try to define space like that? I think it's a sort of, you're conditioned by that kind of the other side of reality where there is also something that has to be applied in reality, a uh, practice, yeah? It's not just speculative. Daniel, in your case, in my case, I, I blame Wolf Bricks for that. <laughs> he's, he's completely obsessed about you have to make it, you have to build it, you have to make it a building. It has to work through the section, otherwise it doesn't count as architecture. He once actually told me what actually classifies something as architecture is if it has an elevator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I just, I'm always nervous when people use the word reality though, I've got to say, Daniel. I mean, once Coca-Cola started advertising themselves as the real thing, what the hell is reality? And I was speculating on um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel's kind of comment about fantasies of fantasies. Well, actually, if you were Lacanian, the way that we perceive anything is already a kind of fantasy. You've got a fantasy of a fantasy of a fantasy. So I'm not quite sure where we are, but I, I completely agree with the comment that uh, Matthias is kind of putting up is that say, this is really, all this stuff that's emerging is really provoking us to rethink what architecture is, you know, and to challenge it at a theoretical level. I mean, that's the interesting thing about this is it's kind of like you're, just as AI is challenging the, the neuroscientists think what the brains think, it's really challenging us as kind of architectural theorists and creators to think about what is architectural creativity. What I think for us is like, I um, understand also this side of the argument where you're just uh, remain very academic, very uh, speculative with your research. Yeah? But for me, it's always I have the feeling that if if that research doesn't materialize in the real world, in the, and what what I mean by that is really in practice, like to see architecture be built and influenced by by these kind of processes, I'm just wondering wondering why it's why is this process necessary then? Why is this kind of research necessary? It's just a sort of fascination for for myself, or is something that's going to actually improve something? You know. Uh, building design, the way that we are going to design from now on, the way we are going to construct buildings and so on. So I think the angle for me personally will be that, even if I'm very speculative in certain processes, yeah. But I still see that we have to make an impact there, you know. And this is probably, we go now in the discussion AI and architecture. Now, uh, it's really for me, I see it like, you know, there are already 80% of architecture that is not done by architects. So if we, if we, steer away and we we just continue being very speculative more than 80 percent is not is going to be done by non-architects so i think we with ai i think we have the chance actually to gain territory and suddenly you know an architecture office is going to be able to generate let's say 10 projects when normally it will be able to generate just one project or something yeah and uh this is just a very pragmatic let's say perspective now i'm just jumping in that pragmatic uh but uh but yeah, I mean, we, we have to look also at this aspect. Yes, I understand research. We have to do research and be speculative and explore ideas. But in at the same time, we have to try to find a way how those ideas find their way in, uh, in practice. Yeah, For me, yeah, I, I'm always struggling with this because I'm developing DP and blah on a very speculative level. And then also the same DP and blah has to work also on uh, optimizations and uh, like fabrication aspects and so on, yeah. So it's always this kind of like back and forth. I'm describing it with with your head in the cloud and your feet in the, on the ground, something like that. You always have to dream for crazy stuff, but somehow you have to to uh, anchor yourself in reality. In reality, in the sense of those things, they have to be uh, applied, yeah. And like Matthias was saying, yeah, probably it's uh, Wolf Breaks influence here. 
that if if it's not uh, something that is built, it's not yeah. architecture. But, yeah. but le le let me jump on this comment because uh, that's that's what I like about your work, Daniel. That you have like this multi-layer approach about your research. And uh, but but anyway, I, I I didn't want to sound. I mean, I'm, I'm a practitioner too, but I don't know what it really means to be a practitioner. But anyway, supposedly I, I'm I'm building too. So I, I understand that there is like certain recognition of the three dimension to putting matter certain spaces and I understand it but the, what I what I was referring uh, and what I was expecting you answer is like because of your and your when, when you was talking for example about the idea of augmentation the idea of augmentation it was like a, a really complex concept and it's not just in terms of uh, visual representation of the space it's not just virtual reality for example it's more like an idea that is about information in this multi-layer understanding or logic that you mentioned and i, I understand that this is why it's not only three-dimensional because a building is not only three-dimensional you have temporal dimension you have uh, quantities of things and complexity in different levels so even in something that you can in a way represent in a three-dimensional way the reality is like there are more than three dimension uh, in what we are building also. So that, that was, uh, I was referring more to the idea of augmentation that to the, and, and I don't consider that you, 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 you have like this approach uh, only like, um, and what you'd say about reality. I, I, I believe that you, you see in different uh, layers and I, I believe this is important for an architectural understanding of what we are doing. So that just to yeah, mention that. I agree, Thank I agree you. with that, like, uh, I mean, uh, I know that um, I was pushed in a way quite a lot, like why you don't work in 3D? And that was like from the very beginning, like why you don't work in 3D architecture is 3D. But for me, it was always this kind of question of, yes, I understand architecture itself has to be a 3D object something, but there are multiple processes that don't require 3D. And you, you need a lot of other processes that you have to engage with in the design process that don't require 3D. So then, and to, to, uh, to reach the level of 3D, I think you need a lot of processes that are not fully 3D. Like also space grammar is not necessarily just a 3D condition. So how do you get there? Yeah? So then suddenly you have to develop an entire process that operates at a maybe two dimensional or one dimensional level, who knows? And then from there, maybe you get at one point at a phase where you convert things in 3D, but you convert things in 3D by informing that 3D with all the layers and steps that you have. Because I mean, this is this is something that I, I find that is the most amazing thing about AI, like this kind of ability in a way to to go cross scales and learn cross scales and then embed all that knowledge into a final 3D. Uh, of course, it's also important to have research that looks only at 3D without all the other layers. Yeah, but uh, if if you want to say that you know the architecture that we are doing with AI is superior than the architecture that we do with uh, with uh, parametric tools, uh, I think it has to have this kind of component, like this kind of embedded, you know, intelligence that uh, with uh, with uh, parametric models probably you're not able to to do. Yeah, so uh, there, that's where I see personally the potential. Yeah, I understand the the research that I'm also doing, which is just addressing one layer. But in the end, if we can build up, you know, all these layers and have in a way uh, an architecture that is super intelligent. For me, that would be the, the goal, yeah? Like that, I think we can address a lot of problems going now again, very pragmatic. Uh, yeah, and I see Matthias was saying probably the number is even higher, yeah? So probably the number of uh, of buildings done by non-architects is even higher than 80%. But we have like huge challenges when it comes to uh, the build environment and the amount of buildings that we have to build. And uh, we, we as architects, as we are, or at least this circle, it's mostly like star architect, let's say, kind of circle that we are in right now. So we, we have certain amazing goals when it comes to architecture and quality and so on. But uh, we have to also keep an eye of how we are going to apply this kind of uh, ideas in reality, in practice, sorry. Uh, because uh, if we really want to have an impact and really have an impact in the sense of designing and uh, building buildings that are super efficient and also aesthetically pleasing and also culturally uh, probably uh, 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 placed. I think we need more than just what we have right now, yeah? And I think AI can really help us get there and also be competitive with, with the rest of 80, 90% of whoever is doing that architecture, you know? So, yeah. I mean, just maybe I throw something in there. That is to say that 
what we're discovering, I think, is that the the practices, and, and I agree that it's practice is, 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 is actually super important, but the practices that are really kind of interrogating this or engaging with these kind of new forms um, are actually the same practices back in the, the, the late 80s that were kind of engaging with a kind of a, a criticality. And that, I mean, I always see theory as being asking questions in a, in a, in a you know, productive way. You ask questions to challenge your assumptions and so on. And that doesn't have to be a kind of overtly theoretical one through Derrida and so on. It's still a kind of critical approach. And it's interesting that those practices, Sahadid Architects, Corp, Immoblau, Morphosis, are also the ones that are kind of engaging with AI right now and, and exploring it. And it seems to me maybe also as a form of criticality, kind of challenging, questioning what it is about uh, you know, traditional ways of operating as architects needs to be opened up. So in some ways, I see this whole AI project as a kind of quasi-theoretical kind of project about calling into question uh, received assumptions about what it is to be an architect. So I think, for example, there are many, uh, let's say, um, not lay architects, Let's say average. That yeah. Instead of star, let's say we go one level uh, lower. Um, so many of those offices probably they have huge challenges when it comes to really. Uh, let's talk about per performative. Let's say design. Yeah. So they have huge challenges. They don't have the resources, and they end up with buildings that they end up with. Yeah. Or they end up in, uh, putting in a lot of effort just to have something uh, from that perspective uh, uh, quite efficient. And then they don't have time for designing more stuff, yeah. And I think if you have then this kind of system that you know we speed up the process and make them very easy, then probably you you allow for more time than for architects to spend more time on quality of design, yeah. So I think, of course, star architects in a way they are going to take advantage of this and probably they are going to increase their output of great work, which is amazing, yeah. But then on the other side, I think also the other types of architects that are not necessarily star architects, let's say, they are going to also have an increase in quality and maybe they are going to have a better output when it comes to design then, as you know, less resources are going to be allocated for, for this kind of performance or other kind of aspects that can be automated. Let me let me just throw something else in there. I mean, I, I think this makes a lot of a, a lot of sense what you're saying, and I think the challenge for practice is to find a way of how to undertake this research on the back of funding that's coming on in totally based on the research output of the or the, the work coming out of the office. But what it also seems to me is interesting about these. Let me just take these three practices of of, of Zahadid architects, Corp and, and, and Morphosis is both are very much connected to academia, and that's uh, most explicitly, I think, with Zahadid architects, where I think the DRL operates as a kind of a, a kind of research branch that somehow has colonized the office through charge and so on. But there's a kind of like there is a kind of to and throw whereby academia becomes this kind of support network um, that is kind of helping that project. Okay, we, we I just wanted we, we should be wrapping up. Come back one more point yeah. very, very briefly. And when, when you say, Neil, that, that um, this particular research challenges the uh, what it means to be an architect, I don't feel it challenges it much more than other generative algorithmic ways of design had already. And I think what uh, we do find, obviously, I mean, the, the way it ties into authorship is I think the following that what has been one more time undermined is maybe the myth of authorship, but the societal institution of authorship remains intact. And uh, why? Because we need authorship means in a way, just somebody's taking responsibility in, in, uh, within the public discourse or with, uh, with, with respect to a client and a professional identity. It might not be individual names. It might be OMA, ZHA. Um, it, it is authors of, of books and arguments, scientific papers. So that's all very, very much required as a, also as a point of reference, which points you to uh, an, an oeuvre and the, the absence of authorship attributions would be just chaotic. So you have the death of the author in the, in, in the French post-structuralist um, um, theory, but, but, but this discourse couldn't have functioned without authors. <laughs> and the, record, the, trace, the tracing of authorships across across uh, articles and across oeuvres and, and, and reference and cross-references. So, so that's authorship and the same works with architecture, but the attribution is not necessarily individualized, but it is a societal uh, institution which is indispensable. 
about the myth of course which 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 is carrying with that has been shattered already many times and i don't see it's kind of particularly the the, the final uh, the, the shattering what has already been shattered five times is maybe is maybe not as as, as monumental uh, uh, a thing but but I think I wanted to come back. I mean, also this point which which Daniel has in terms of augmentation rather than automation. And if you look at some of the morphoses, uh, let's say uh, versioning and, and and replications of compositions which will be accepted and rep recognizable as morphoses, of course that's automation to some extent. The same with with with, with Himmelblau and and the, the studies which are on our work. So. So the augmentation then comes in when you go from the style gun to the cycle gun and you go into these strange hybridizations and novelty creations which, which, which have still enough redundancy and connection uh, with, with something which we might want to aspire to. And that is, the, that is you know, the forest and, and the Gaudi thing is still, is still a, a fantastic landmark. So, so, so and uh, I wonder if, I mean, and that's what I would be interested in to see how we, how, you know, that, uh, which which injection of novelty. Now, the thing is superiority of the results. Yes, to some extent on that level of, of stimulation, but of course we haven't, I don't know how this, uh, you know, my my, my the projects obviously go beyond that. So, so there's a whole series of criteria which, which you have to leave behind. And the reinjection might be um, not co coherent with, uh, might not allow the, the novelties to survive. So I think, the, of course, the, uh, it's, 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 it's a fantastic potential, but the, 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 the proof of concept is still out. It's still, um, <laughs> that's maybe also what makes it exciting. There isn't, there isn't yet a, a, an architecture which beats the, the, the maturest and sophisticated, let's say, versions of tectonism, which we, which we, which we, which, which, which we could present as being, being the current state of the art. We, we have obviously there is a potential, but there's no, no uh, um, bypassing yet. But I'm, I'm fascinated. So I will come back and start thinking about how to set up a, 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 an experiment where you see where you where you where you surpass what we can do now. And I'm, I have to think about that. So, so I can. It, it I'm feels. I mean, I'm grateful for being invited. And I'm. That's what we. What I'm going to think about now. Thanks, Patrick. I mean, I, I, and I hope for, hopefully next week we can bring you in to go and talk about the office itself. And I also would love to be dealing with the kind of question about deep Himmelblau and how this relates much more closely to, to other forms of practice. I just want to finish with one comment on that to say that, you know, we're talking about this kind of relationship of theory to practice between academia and profession. I think there's also another kind of interesting form of relationship that I can see in operation right now. And that is a kind of a swarm intelligence whereby we are comparing each other to what one another and we're kind of watching. And there's something I think, you know, in, through the logic of swarm intelligence, it's a subject we'll be looking at in a few weeks time, there is a kind of emergent, something emerging. And I think today what we begin to see see is actually the almost stepping back from that and seeing the flock of bird kind of thing we're seeing a kind of an emergent set of sensibilities about you know about different approaches and things and, and, and a set of concerns about three-dimensional issues and so on about publications and so on and there's something ex which i make this to make to my, to my mind is really exciting right now there's something happening and uh, it's it's wonderful to be for, for you all to be contributing towards this towards this 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 greater whole something very exciting right now to my mind it's like it reminds me of the deconstructive moment when architecture was revitalized. I just want to finish because we should we should close up now by thanking everyone who's been contributing today. Um, thank you, Daniel, Matthias, and Emmanuel, especially Emmanuel. It must be about one o'clock in the morning in Singapore. And thank you for all the questions coming in from Patrick and Marina and elsewhere. Um, and let's continue next week. This has been, I, I think, feel like we, we've just begun to sort of address some of these questions. Um, so it's been a fascinating session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting us. Neil. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for the Thanks, invitation. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone.